when someone puts a gun to your head and you tell them to shoot. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. <laughs> That's fucking cool. Who said or that? Or reversing a gun uh, to your head. Atlanta fan. Yeah, that is cool. That's August fucking 2016. cool. Yeah, go ahead, shoot, go ahead, bitch. Shoot. You won't. <laughs> yeah. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Put in my take, YouTube, like and subscribe, like and subscribe, best podcast in the world, like and subscribe, like and subscribe, like and subscribe. On today's part of my take, we have a twofer, Friday twofer going into Labor Day weekend. We have For who? A, we had a twofer. We got twofer, Hank. We had a twofer. For the people? For the people. For the people. For, For the folks. The people. Uh, we've got, uh, Tom Fernelli. Hank just totally threw me off my game there. I don't know what he's doing. Well, you always say twofer for the people. I'm well, sorry. I didn't, I was trying to change it up that time. Sorry. My brain is trained for, I'm sorry. Hank's okay. Reset. Up. Right, we'll start, he we'll is. Start, he is. We'll he, no, no, no. We'll reset. No, yeah. Hank went Spicy to the gym Hank. today. Hank went to the gym today. So he thinks he's tougher than all of us. All right. Twofer for the people. Tom Fernelli. College football. Huge slate this weekend. We talk about uh, some of the games this weekend. He gives you a lock, so you're going to want to listen to that. And who's going to be good this year? Then we have Ken Burns, the most famous documentarian of all time. I think the only documentarian. Ken Burns has his own genre. Yeah, he's uh, he's incredible. So we talked about his new uh, four-part series on Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time. So we have that, and then we have Mount Rushmore, things that make you – when you do – Things that make you seem cool. Yeah, can I just say that with Ken Burns, if maybe you have a dad that you've been trying to get into part yeah. of my take for a while, yeah. this is a great dad gateway episode. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, going to be a great show, and we're brought to you by our friends at Dave & Buster's. Dave & Buster's adds more winning to anything and everything from regular Friday nights to first dates and especially to watching the game with the guys. It all gets more ding, ding, ding at D&Bs. And this season, there's no better place to watch football than at Dave & Buster's because you get more of everything that makes the game so great. Dave & Buster's has 40-foot wide TV screens. Talk about big right there. You get to see the whole game in super HD. Dave & Buster's has new menu items. All season long, they have their beverage game, which is always at the tip top point. Cocktails and beers to choose from. There's more space than other bars. You know Dave and Buster's. It's huge. You never have to worry, oh, am I going to be able to sit? Oh, am I going to be comfortable? There's nothing worse than being jammed into a bar. Dave and Buster's has a lot of space. And if you have friends that are not into sports, if you have maybe someone who wants to just win some stuff and play some fun games at halftime, Dave & Buster's is a place to be. It's got everything, the best place to watch sports, the best place to go play some games, the best place to have some drinks with your friends. Dave & Buster's is the best. And more ding, 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 add more ding, ding, ding to your game with more food, more drinks, more screen, only at Dave & Buster's. Okay, let's go. Welcome to part of my take presented by Dave and Buster's, the greatest place on earth. Yes, I said that. Today is Friday, September 3rd, and boys, football is back. Let's go. He didn't go. think I was going to do it Let's there. Go. He didn't football. think I, he thought I was going to talk about Brooks right off the top because I said, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll do Brooks right off the top. Nope. I snuck attack him with the football is back. Football is back. And guess what? Next week, football is going to be even more back ah, than it is right now because there's, there's more back. Again. But right now, this is a great Friday of football. Yeah. Really good Friday of football. Uh -huh. And then obviously, we've got week. It, is Friday technically week one or is it still yeah, no, week that'd be zero? week one. I feel like it's week point nine. No, that'd be week of one. Football. We're in week one. And then, and then Saturday. We're week huge, one. Huge sleep. Well, tonight is week on. one. Yeah, tonight's week yeah. one. No, actually, last night was week one. Right. Well, I, yeah. I had UAB. My 16 and a half winner. Week one. Uh, yeah, so we're taping this early because this is probably our last chance uh, for the next five months to have a semi-early night. So if Ohio State loses, ha-ha. I think they won't, but ha-ha. Uh, great, great slate coming up. We're going to talk to Tom Fornelli about college football um, and this weekend. We should talk about Brooks, though. So... Here's our schedule. We're not going to obviously have a show on Monday because it is Labor Day. We will, though, have a show on Tuesday with our friend Andy Staples recapping all of college football. And then on Wednesday, we will have another show and then Friday as well. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday next week because Tuesday we're going out to Liberty National. PFT and I are caddying for our guy. 
Brooks Kafka against our boss, Dave Portnoy, in a $250,000 Loser Leaves Town charity match. Mm-hmm. But but Brooks is a professional golfer. Won't he destroy him? That's well, a good question, Good Hank, question. But he's going southpaw. Mm-hmm. He's, he's hitting lefty. Lefty. He put out a video last week, which is pretty impressive, of him teeing off off of a uh, Coors Light bottle, Yep, and he just knocked the top right off of it. He's deadly accurate with his driver left-handed. Mm-hmm. I think having me and Big Cat on the bag is going to be a huge advantage yep. for at least like the first hole that we're on until Big Cat and I get too tired it's and gonna, inevitably ask him to just carry his own club. It's going to be uh, an emotional jolt for about 15 minutes for him, us being caddies, because we have our caddy suits. We're, we're in the big caddy jumpers, which... Brooks told me, be prepared to sweat your balls off. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's going to suck. Not an issue. Not an issue. Uh, but it's going to be fun. And you're going to be able to watch it on live stream. I think we'll be on the YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter. Jake will be there. Billy will be there. Liam, Hank. And we have new club covers. Is that what you call them? Yeah, club Golf head covers. covers. We're, head covers. we're covers. We're, co- we're caddies. Head covers. Head Cap. covers. We got part of my take head covers, part of my take... Uh, not yarmulkes. Towels. No, not yarmulkes. Uh, there's a limited amount. They're going on sale Friday, 10 a.m. So if you want one, if you're a golfer, make sure you you listen, get it at 10 a.m. Because they're probably gonna be sold out. And we then should, we're gonna have, we, we should do part of my take yarmulkes. Yeah, for Yom Kippur. Yeah, and then and then Brooks is gonna be on the show afterwards, so we'll have him on for Wednesday, which will be great. So it's gonna be a great day. Everyone tune in. We wanted to get the message out there in case you get to the show late on Tuesday. Uh, listening up, what have you talked to Brooks about yes. how he feels yes. about? Because so Dave. Yes. Dave is who he's playing. Doesn't really golf, but his mom was a golf uh, instructor, or coach. teacher, coach growing up. So he has a good swing, good fundamentals. Foundation's there, but he doesn't really play. So he's not he's not like in great golf shape, I would say. But it really is, I don't yeah. know, I don't know so where Brooks is at. Brooks has told me that um, he can drive it far with lefty. He can actually putt decently lefty. He said the irons... Are a little dicey. We don't know where it's going sometimes. That's, but that's fine though. I, I honestly think that the long drives are gonna be intimidating. Yeah. Right off the tee. If he can hit Bombs. if he can bomb it like three hundred yards, that's great. With us on the bag. He's we already know that he's got like the favor of God and nature. Did you see his putt with the butterfly today? Love it. A butterfly I didn't, but I love it. followed his ball and knocked it in. It looked love like it. Tinkerbell following Peter Pan around. Is this like he's, a Tom Brady video? He, he's got uh, well, I was gonna on say he does have the same crew uh that Films and edits Tom Brady's videos. Filming so and edits. No, no, this was videos. during this a tournament. Real. It oh. was in live. It was tournament play. Beautiful. Mike Tirico, both perverted and Italian, was the one that was on the call and narrated the butterfly shoving Brooks's ball into the. I club. love it. So yep. we need more butterflies out there. Um. All right. So yeah, that's going to be on Tuesday morning. It's going to be great. We're going to be out at Liberty National. I'm very excited for that. We're going to say. What happens if he loses? Uh, we the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree to that necessarily. <laughs> We haven't just. But it would be we thrilling. Was that not this. thrilling for a second there? What do you wear? We my, all quit. My big concern <laughs> is well, a couple things. It's the caddy suit, right? So we're wearing like the Masters all white caddy suit after uh-huh. Labor Day. Some would say that's a fashion faux pas. What do you wear underneath the caddy suit? Do you just go? You just go nude? No, I think, raw dog I think you, should, you wear shorts, maybe in a t-shirt. If you've learned from the frisbee golf, you should probably wear an undershirt. I yeah. should probably wear an undershirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, but Otherwise, yeah, the ladies I, will be out. What happens if they lose? We. Uh, I think we distance ourselves from Brooks is probably the, the the way to do it for a brief stretch, and then we come back. We How will you deflect faster. blame? Uh, I will. Hmm. Good question, Hank. Um, I'll probably blame someone around me. I'm gonna fake an injury right Billy, off the bat. I'm telling you, like if it's not looking good in the front nine, I'm gonna cramp up Billy, badly. Billy did something. Fill in the blank. God damn it, Billy. That just sounds natural, doesn't it? So we'll just blame mm. Billy. Maybe we'll have Billy uh, help us. He'll be like Caddy Apprentice. He'll walk with us so that we can blame him if things go wrong. Like we need someone around us who it's like, here's our fall guy. And then mm-hmm. maybe Billy is that guy. Don't you think? Or Jake the Jinx. Jake the Jinx is also, he's on the board when it comes to blame. I'm worried about, w- about Billy wearing camouflage out on the golf course. Yeah, and not we being able to see him. him. I'm just going to trip over Billy at some point. <laughs> We're going to lose him. Can people oh, no, come dude, out and watch? We can, yeah. We can, we can but just, not anymore, I don't think, because I think we're full. We can oh, blame Hurricane yeah. Ida. We can just be like, yeah, the course conditions weren't great because of the rain. Yes. By the way, thank you, Billy, for your service. You were pushing cars last night in New Jersey. Deep water. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Yep. Great guy. That's a fucking hero. Everyone survived Hurricane Ida. That sucked. 
That really sucked. Yeah. It, it looked pretty dicey for a little bit in my apartment when the ceiling started to crack same, again. Same, same. Like, there was a big gap opening up right above me, and I was like, I'm going to die a week before football starts, NFL football starts, and that would be, if I'm going to die, kill me right after the Super Bowl. Yes. Don't, don't let me wait through an entire summer and read all these articles about training camp depth charts and then knock me off like mm-hmm. a, a week before kickoff. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, all right, what else is going on in sports before we get to our Mount Rushmore? Mark Davis has a uh, super layer man. Mansion, which looks awesome and hopefully has a pf changs inside of it oh i love the mansion i i absolutely am digging it's got in the blueprints it says here's the man cave it looks incredible 14 million dollars it's right outside vegas we got to go there at some point we got to get an invite so uh guy fieri if you're listening i know you're a fan of the show i know you're in close with the davis family you're going to get the invite to the pool party if you have a plus one, use part of my take as your entire plus mm-hmm. one. I need to be there. There's also uh, big news in ESPN world, which is Stephen A. Smith has found his rotating cast of people he's just going to mow down on first Uh-oh. take. On Fridays, who do you think is going to be his co-host on Fridays, Big Cat? Tebow. Yes, it's Tim Tebow. Jesus Christ. Tim Tebow. I'm going to call it Good Friday. Good. That's, what, that's a, a PFT trademark. And it's going to be him just... The whole point of Tebow being on that show is just so Stephen A. Smith can rub it in Skip Bayless's face. Like, I have yeah. your boyfriend, and he's yep. my coworker. Yep, yep. Um, who else is on? I, all I paid attention to is <laughs> was Tebow. Stephen A. Got versus it. Jesus H. Yeah. Michael Irvin, I think. Oh, Michael Irvin, okay. All right, so... He'll be calm. He's going to bring him up and knock him down. Just screaming at each other. Yeah. Get the blood going. I, I like love it. it. Um, all right. Anything else that we should get to before Mount Rushmore? Obviously, there's football games tonight, but again, we're taping a little early. And guess what? You get enough college oh. football with Tom Fernandez. Michael Irvin with ESPN? I don't think so. I think he just floats. Yeah, he I think is he does kind of hits. A f- oh, no, wait. He is. I think he's doing both. I'm reading he, this article. It still says he's an analyst for NFL Network. Yeah, he's a free- ah. Michael, Michael Irvin is a freelancer. He just does hits places. Playmaker, yeah. Just not on the pipe anymore. Mm hmm. He's oh, remember that time he was down sweating just profusely in uh, where were they? Might have been Dallas. Yes, on TV. It was Big like, sweat. Whoa, dude. He actually trumps. Yeah. Both Patrick Ewing and Chapman. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, uh, tonight U.S. Soccer kicks off World Cup qualifying against El Salvador. In that in would the, be a shame. The hexagonal has now improved to the octagonal. It's would two more be teams. a real shame. I'm not. I'm not down with that this year. I'm not down with the negativity from Big Cat. I'm not negative. Team. Wait. Whoa. Whoa. I, what? When was I negative? I said it would be a shame if we didn't make the World Cup. I think that this is the year. This is the year for U.S. soccer to do what? To make the World Cup. Okay, but it would be a shame. And if we just keep, kept on missing them, it would be a shame. I want them to make it. Although, who? Ca- when is the World Cup? Uh, Dubai. Next year. November. This year? No, next year. During football season. During football season. Don't yeah. care. Oh, I know Novak six wins from glory. The guy just does it all. Oh. One down six has to he, go. Has he berated with anyone? Blake. <laughs> what? Blake put up an Instagram with him. Blake Griffin? Oh, he's oh. at the U.S. Open? I don't know. Yeah. I think they were at like a dinner Bortles. or something. Hell yeah. Jake, how do you pronounce guy's that guy's together. name? Sissy Pass? Tsitsipas. 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 He only, goes to the bathroom yeah, too much. Only reason I know about him is he's like stopped three matches so far in the U.S. Open because he just always has to shit during them. He might have a UTI. No, it's his the other hole. Uh. It's his butt. He's he's got Lamar Jacksonitis. They, they've had to like delay matches, and his opponent is getting pissed off at him because he has to poop. Tsitsipas. So that's that's my new goat now in tennis. Okay. The guy that shits all the time. Um, all right, let's get to Mount Rushmore. Let's do Mount Rushmore. So we are brought to you by our friends at Cross Country Mortgage. Cross Country Mortgage is much like us at Barstool. People first group of people. They are dedicated to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, convenient, and less stressful home financing or refinancing experience. Check it out now. Rates are unbelievably low. Don't pay uh, the bank more money than you need to. Our friends at Cross Country Mortgage, mortgage, mortgage make it super simple to figure out how much you can save on a monthly basis. And if you own a home right now, you can refinance with Cross Country Mortgage. So rates are an all-time low. They may never get this low again. Call today for a fast, free rate quote. Our partners will save you a lot of money. Call today, and our friends at Cross Country Mortgage will give you a free home valuation that is free to you just for calling. Just like the all-star athlete, Cross Country Mortgage pushes themselves through the entire lending process. If they get blocks, they figure out ways around to get the ball over the line. So go to crosscountrymortgage.com slash barstool to learn more about your future home buying experience or refinancing your current mortgage, Cross Country Mortgage LLC, NMLS 3029, all loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Okay, 
Mount Rushmore. Who wants to start? Or we do numbers? Numbers. Or we're doing the Mount Rushmore of things uh, that make you seem cool. Things that make you seem things cool. Things that make you seem or look cool. Cool, yeah. yeah I'm right. taking... I'm going to go 50, right down 50. the middle. 17. 69. Playing right, the odds. Is this one last 22. dance for Mount Rushmore? Uh, or are we gonna do I think next, we go all the way week. up to NFL season, yep. right? Okay. So it will be Wednesday will be the last Mount Rushmore. The last dance. And we'll, you know what? I'll say it right now. We'll do it with, with Brooks. We'll do the last Mount Rushmore with Brooks. We'll think of something good, and that will be it for the summer. A lot of Thursday, people have been requesting Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmores that we've done in we've, the entire past. But we've already done that before. Have we? We would yeah. never do that again. Yeah. No, we, we would we, never, ever. We could do the Mount Flushmore of Mount Rushmore. Also, one yeah, we get a lot is PMT yet. moments. And didn't we? Do, oh, we did Grit Week moments. Yeah. Okay. We'll think. We'll consider those. All right. What, what 17. Was 20, 22. 5 0. What did you guys say? 16. Oh, <laughs> dude. That's, that's funny. Cool. <laughs> 16. 60. Oh. So Billy and Jake decide the order. We'll go first. Hank goes second. PFT third. And, and I'll go last. Okay. Now, is this more of a, a Hank? Or sorry, is this more of a Billy list or is this a Jake list? Or is this total collaboration? It depends how the oh everything okay. goes. I don't know. <laughs> okay. have, you, have you decided already on your 1-1? One, one? Are you doing that right now? No, nope. they were, they were they debating. I, I, all I heard when they were getting ready was Billy was like, we should do this first. And Jake was like, we should do something more serious. Buying a frog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go for it, Billy. I'm, I'm giving you the green light. Uh, something that is extremely cool, respecting women. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Good so that was the one that was like, it's a, it's not a joke, but Billy's making a joke of it. No, it's very serious. That's yeah, very right. cool. Why it are you winking cool, at Jake? us? That's cool. Yeah, okay, cool. Very cool. Nice. Who, who was the last woman you respected? Quick. Margaret Thatcher. Nice. Uh, problematic. Okay. Uh, me and Bubba will go with giving the waitress your card without looking at the bill. Uh, I love yeah. it. I do it all the time. Good it's move. the best fucking feeling. Power Because it's just fast. Speed, speeds it up. Yep. Good move. Speeds it up. Get in, get out. You don't even need to look at it. Yep. It is what it is already. Okay. Uh, number one for me. This is my 1-1. One, one. Glad it's still on there. Uh, Executing a perfect dap or handshake mm. with somebody. Yep. When it's crisp, when you get that snap, when you get the pop, and you, it looks like you knew mm -hmm. that you were going to pull it off mm -hmm. the entire time, but in reality, you were just full sweating, full anxiety going into this handshake, and you nail it. Yep. Very relatable. Very relatable. Yep. Very yep. relatable. All right. Uh, I will go with uh, dunking. Dunking is very cool. If you can dunk, that's a fucking awesome thing that people will be like, whoa, that guy dunks. Um, and then I will go with. Knowing the bartender. When you go into a bar and you know the bartender, the bartender knows you, people are like, damn, that's pretty fucking cool. Mm -hmm. It's like, give a little conversation. You're a regular. It's cool. All right. Uh, my number two is you just... You don't think so? No, no, I, no, I, cool. I, no I, I was looking at Hank. I have a similar one. I'm trying oh. to decipher whether or not it's going like to count it. or not. Okay, okay. I had Fair. I had one that is similar too, but I'm, I feel like that covers it. That's yeah. It's a good move when you go in. Yeah. Especially if... Other people see you. That's nice. Yes. But I'll tell you what. It's even it's even nice if you're the only person going on in. It makes you feel cool. Yeah. It makes about you yourself. It makes you feel cool, and also it makes you like. There's there's definitely when you go into a bar. There's a hierarchy of like people in the bar, and you immediately jump to the top. Yep. Uh, my number two is going to be riding a motorcycle. Nice. Riding a motorcycle on my always, list. Always very cool. Always. It was either that or rollerblading for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, it's one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> those you, are, usually, those go hand in hand. Usually, it's the same person. Usually, that's what they have in the saddlebags on the motorcycles or blades. Yeah, I actually like to ride a motorcycle with rollerblades for extra stability on the side. Yeah, I just keep my car. feet on the ground. I don't even walk anymore. I just it's wheels all the way down, baby. <laughs> all right, Hank. Con uh, 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 look of consternation has gone over his face. So the one that this I've been nailing words this week. I don't know what's up with that. Similar to yours, Big Cat, but it's when uh, it's like a, a crowded bar. There's a line outside, and you walk up, and you either know like a manager comes out to let you in, or yep. the bouncer lets you in, yep. and everyone in line sees that you just walk up and get in, and they're immediately like, "Oh, that guy's got to be cool." Skipping so, line, yeah. yeah. Like I'd say, I'd say that's legally cutting lines is a very cool move. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not yeah, yeah. Like le like it's not something that people are like. Oh, you can't cut. Like being able to cut. Right. Yeah. Yep. Very very good one, Billy. Billy's like. I had one that we wanted last. Oh, jeez. These guys. 
It's falling apart. Playing contact sports. <laughs> Playing contact sports. Very is cool. cool. How Very many cool? Fun. How Very many cool. contact sports are there? Do you define basketball or is that that's not a contact sport? Football is, Wait, football is not a contact. Yeah, that's helmet, dumb. helmet sport. No, that's athletes. a collision sport. Football is a collision sport, not a contact sport. What yeah. are you talking? You don't want dude. Watch enough basketball TV. is definitely a contact sport. Yeah, it's not too much contact anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Playing basketball in the year 1986. Soccer so you're saying sport. it's soccer contact sport? Absolutely not. There's ju- <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't get this. <laughs> absolutely not. That's an absolutely not for the people at home. Is baseball? Did you see Ronaldo slap that guy? No. He I did contact. see that. Pathetic. Gross. Ball. Pathetic. I just love hating Ronaldo. It's something I truly don't care about, but I love doing it online. Oh, I, I really do not like Ronaldo. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't really care. Don't like him. <laughs> uh, all right, playing contact sports, Billy. Number your third pick. Boozing. Boozing. Having a cold one. Nice. Nice, Playing Billy. Exports boozing. What was your first one again? Respecting women. Respecting women. Yeah, he's got it all. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to beat up this one. Um, having a quarter field named after you. Yes, oh. that is cool. It, wait, no, just a field. Or not court. A, no, not yeah, a court. No, no. Court's kind of lame. Court's really lame. Yeah, court's lame. You can't name a court after no. yourself. The court no. is the court. Yeah. But field. A field, yeah, because it's a living thing. Yeah. You want a bunch of dead stuff named and after it just you? Means, it literally means you're either filthy rich or you're an absolute legend. But either way, if you're like, yeah, this is my field. Like, okay. It's like, oh, holy shit. Or that right. you like made them name it after you yeah, sometimes. Yeah. That can be an option, too, for a court. Well, sometimes you're, like, the most winningest uh, person in your entire profession. So as, out of a sign of respect, you get a court named after you. Just yeah. hypothetically speaking, but right? There's a lot of other examples as well. I actually it's think more, I was more talking about like, uh, like you know, NBA players that will like renovate their town's gym and then they name they it can. after them. Where it's like they're still they're not old; they're like active, active younger people, but they're mm-hmm. just such a such a G that they have a their high school's I, gym name. I after think them. that if you get a court named after you and you're the all time winningest person at your profession, yep. it's actually like kind of that's small potatoes. That's almost a slap in the face. It should be called like the house that so and so built. I like or that. Not Conference. necessarily, not, like that. not necessarily the the court itself. Mm-hmm. But that that counts. With, like in with this example, like if you no. say the house that PFT built for the studio, yeah, that would be way cooler than being like this is the PFT podcasting table. Mm-hmm. Which one would you rather have? For me, the choice is easy. <laughs> All right, PFT, your next pick uh, for mine. I'm gonna go with nailing a parallel park in front of an audience mm. so if there's like a, an outdoor seating arrangement at a restaurant set up you pull up next to it it's a tough parallel park the stakes are high people are watching and you nail it and not even the front swoop you just nail it in the very first backup one step out hit the button in your remote lock the car so i uh, great pick i this is something separate uh, not about the pick in specific but i do think that uh parallel parking the art of parallel parking has been completely bastardized by these cameras now. Yep. It sucks. It's not the same. It doesn't feel even like... Asterix. It, it really does. Like, I'll parallel park, I'll nail it, and I'll be like, you know what? This is just a different... It's a live ball error. It's, like it's, like, yeah. it's yeah. not the same. It is tough. It was always awesome when it was like, no cameras, just fucking crush it. I'm always shocked also when I rent a car and it has the backup camera. I'm like, ooh, that's fancy. Yeah, and the side cameras, there's everything. Wow, now. they've got a backup camera and everything. Yeah, that came out in like 2005. But yeah. I'm still like... It yeah. blows Ooh, my mind nice. when I see it. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh. Let's see. Let's see. I got to get a couple of good ones here. Um, okay. Uh, fixing stuff. So being the guy who can just fix anything, like, oh. Like it's it's you know like oh the boat like something got broken on on the boat oh I got this I fix it I you know did this real quick the MacGyver of the group the the fixer guy is always cool mm-hmm. anytime someone could do something with their hands fixing a flat tire which I I can do that but uh, or like popping a car hood and then like tinkering around boom you're fixed that's a fucking cool thing uh uh-huh. it's Agreed. a cool thing I mean yeah if it comes to like an appliance in your house yeah one time I fixed a washing machine. I, I saw how to do it on a YouTube video, and then I just copied exactly what the real cool person was doing yep. and did it myself. Didn't tell anybody that that's how I learned how to do it, but I felt like an actual man. Yeah. So fixing things with your hands. That's a cool thing. Um, and then last I'll do having a guy. So having a guy for everything. Like you need tickets, I got a guy. You need this, I got a guy. Mm-hmm. So having just a guy. Every time you need something, hey, I got a guy. Hooking people up with those type of connections, it feels great. 
It's tough though when your guy falls through because yeah. then you have to say my guy well, fell through. Yeah, you have to have a guy though. But there's it's a cool feeling when someone's like, oh, I want to do this. It's like, I got you. I have a guy here. Call this guy and you'll be all set. Mm-hmm. The best feeling in the world. All right. I rarely have it. Sometimes I do it with Billy. Ooh. People are like, I want to get my bench up. I'm like, I have a guy. I got a bench guy. <laughs> I got a bench mob. I want. I want to get a frog. I got a guy. <laughs> uh, all right. My last one. Smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Smoking a cigarette looks cool. Very I, harmful. I don't, I don't care kids who you listening. are. Kids vape these days, kids too. Vape. Yeah, so but, like, but smoking a cigarette. Yeah, no, it's good pick. It's, it's good pick. Age. Smoking, it's good pick. A, smoking an analog cigarette yeah. is cool as it's fuck. Cool. It's cool. Yeah. It is. It is. You're I haven't right. smoked in a long time, but I'm telling you what. like Jake? The second I get back to the North Side Tavern, yep. I'm smoking a full pack of Cowboy Killers. Cop. Cop. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You think you don't think smoking is cool? No, I think smoking cigarettes is gross. Oh, <laughs> all right. So thank you. That's the best endorsement yeah, I could ever was. have. Thank yeah, you, Jake's Jake. cool. Having Jake's allergies. Cool. <laughs> uh, so this one Being actually, Big Cat, Big Cat is a prime example of this, despite his age and his, you know, how f- often he frequents going out and stuff. But being able to win a chug off in deciding oh. fashion is very very cool i still have that yeah. you it's still have that I, have. I can't do it like no matter how much i drink i can't chug fast when you're at a party or somewhere and you see two people like ready three two one and one person just like one second chugs yep. it, the other person has to like take a few gulps the other guy looks cool every time it impresses everyone right. it is like the one thing that i have in the, like, my back pocket i can't do a lot of things i can chug a beer very quickly and every time you do it, i'm like that's cool as fuck yeah you know thank you, you know i appreciate what, you that. know what makes it real cool is that you don't you're never the one who's like hey let's chug this beer no i always right. get so, challenged so like if yeah. somebody gets challenged to it they don't say anything and they step up and they just crush the guy that challenged yes that's the cool part yes I, yeah you're right because walking around being like let's chug is kind of lame well that, that was billy's Billy, fourth yeah billy's well, are you an <laughs> open the throat guy when you chug or did you just muscle it down how far down there you like there's some people yeah, that like, just like just pour like, it you want to go find out Billy? no i don't want to find out but i think it's more i think it's more impressive the guys that don't know that weird trick where they just, just like know. pour he, it down his throat about i think this. billy's trying to see if you run a gimmick offense yeah and that's why no he's really trying, trying to figure out if Are, i have a gag reflex you no know, there's like the fact that the fact that billy like as much as billy drinks like you would still beat him a chug off like that's cool Yes, correct. I would crush you. Now Billy's it, now he's thinking it, about it. In Billy's head right now, it's absolutely a question of like two football teams playing against each other. One runs like flea flickers and reverses, and the other's like, I'll bet you if they just lined up hat on no, hat against us, we. I don't know. There's, there's some I don't guys. Know it. I don't know what. I don't know what I do. I just chug, yeah. I just drink it really fast. Like there's some guys who have that trick where they can just like open their throat and just pour no, it. I, I've reflex. never thought about it. Yeah, I've yeah. never thought about it. How far does your throat open, Billy? I can't do that. I have to muscle it down. Yeah. yeah. No, some There's okay. people out there who you're know so what I'm straight. talking about. God, Billy, you're the yeah. straightest dude That's ever. Dumb. Yeah, dude, you couldn't. Yeah. I, my throat doesn't even, I can't even swallow things. That's how I have to put I a am. finger up my ass to get my throat open. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Our last this pick. guy blew me. I didn't even come. <laughs> Our last pick is pretty basic, kind of open-ended. Being nice. Oh <laughs> that, my god, that's, that's cool. That you know what? Was. You know what? I, I actually think that is, that is cool. It's because, cool because going what? going back to what McConaughey taught yeah, us about being cool. Guys like, that are nice. That's the saying. If sometimes nerds are cool when they're cool about being nerds in movies, I think that's a good answer, Jake. Being nice. Okay, we'll see. I mean, I do think you are cool. Thanks. Yeah, and you are nice. Thanks. Okay, there we go. Uh, what did we miss? A lot. Driving a convertible. Yeah, very cool. Surfing. I had skateboarding on mine. Skateboarding. Leather jackets. Leather jacket. Oh, uh, perfect, like, uh, perfect stubble. Yep. That's a very cool thing. When you see a guy with, like, the perfect facial hair, the movie star stubble, mm-hmm. where it's, like, maybe maybe it's been two days, Yeah. and it's a full... Oh. Very cool. I get that a lot for the high school yeah. and like younger college kids. But uh, being able to buy booze underage or like getting into oh, getting into bars with fake one. IDs, yep. having a fake, ha- being the one guy with a fake ID is as cool as it gets. Yep. But with yes. great power comes great responsibility. It, it is cool until you realize like how much work that you have to do now that yeah. you're the only one that has it. No, also, when I was in college, I was I had no money and I would just go to the store for like ten people, and then with the extra like few dollars, I could buy booze myself. Also. Totally hypothetical. I I don't even know if this is what people do or people talk about. I don't I don't know. It's just totally hypothetical. Being the guy who gets the coke, that's cool. Mm-hmm. 
But that's hypothetical. Yeah. The, being the drug guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Being the yes, drug guy. Yes. That's hypothetical, uh, folks. Being Lenny Kravitz. Lenny Kravitz is just cool. Yep. He hasn't even had the any scarf. bangers in like the last 20 years, Fox. but he's still cool. Pulling, um, pulling off a top hat. That was one where I couldn't. Oh. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to say it because no. I can't, but like not top hat, but like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like the cool, cool hat guy. Yeah. Cool hat, hat guy. guy. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pulling off a cool hat is definitely. There, there's just certain guys that you see them. It's like they're just John Mayer types where they put on a hat and you're like, that guy's fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Packing a huge dinger. Nope. I don't think that's cool. <laughs> it's not as cool as you think that it is. Catching a fish. Cause it, yeah, catching a fish is cool. Cool. Uh, you don't think so? Yeah, catching a fish is what, definitely cool. With the rod? Cool. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, catching yeah. a fish. Taking a picture with your fish and making your Twitter avatar. What, what, what Billy said, though, about packing a dinger, that, it's classic Billy because in the moment, you you feel like you're the coolest person. But you're not. You're the mo actually the most disgusting person in the room at the time. Yeah. And I, that's, that's coming from a guy that does it occasionally. Yeah. Like... You got you got to know okay, that. Okay, it was pretty cool at one point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, but it's not cool. It's not cool. Okay. All right. Puking more than everybody. Um, hitting hitting a dinger. Yeah. Is cool. Hitting a home run. Uh, catching a foul ball and not dropping your beer or your baby. Yep, that's very cool. Being very, all very state cool. in a sport. Yep. <laughs> I, fuck, I had that one on my list, Billy. Were you? <laughs> yeah. Oh hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Which state? New York State. Hell yeah. Um, Sitting courtside. Yeah, like if you sit courtside, it doesn't really matter who you are. You're cool for that game. Frankie Munoz sits courtside. I don't think he's, he's cool. Uh, oh yeah, he's cool. You think Malcolm in the Middle's cool? He's cool. Being uh, verified, Instagram only. Parentheses. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, knowing that it's okay to not be okay. That is cool. That's cool. Talking about mental health on Twitter. Oh, just that's cool. Not worrying about looking cool. Is yeah. cool. Yeah. That's uh, true. Oh, buying being chuggy. Ta no, <laughs> tattoos dang. are cool. Buying around for the house. Yep. You got, it, it's got to be like though, like sleeves are cool. Yes, sleeves are very cool. Like if you're gonna commit, full, fully yeah. commit. Oh, being able to take shots with not an issue at all, very cool. Yep, with no caveats of yeah, you know anything but tequila or like yeah, could you make it soco if you're gonna go whiskey? Yeah, just like t ripping one and not batting an oh. eye. Yeah, someone handing you a shot, and not being like ah, uh, like actually th maybe the coolest thing you can do at a bar is walking in, ordering a nice cold Coors Light. And a shot of Jameson. Yep. Ripping the shot, drinking the beer. Shot and a beer. Yeah. Uh, how Just about... Yeah. When, when you're somewhere and you say, I'll have the usual. Yeah, yeah. Having a usual drink. I had that one on my list. Ordering without looking at the menu. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Like, mm -hmm. no, we don't... We're saying, no, we don't need that. Mm -hmm. And then telling the server what you want. Not needing a bottle opener to open a bottle. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Like, like, I don't Very have a bottle cool. opener. And then someone just grabs it and fucking <gasps> either like a lighter... The teeth is I it, it grosses me out, but it can be cool. Like sometimes, yeah. like that's that, one I if I can open it with anything. Yeah, that's the one. S semi cool guy, uh, being able to tie a sick knot when you're around a boat. That's yes. a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Like that is being able to just whip out one. Just be like, yeah, I got this. What about magic? What about knowing magic? But not like mm, extreme nah. amounts of magic. I'm not, a, I'm not down with the jicks. Uh, uh, not extreme amounts of magic where you obviously had to like read a bunch of books or go to summer camp for it. That's the only good magic. But though. no, no, a magic where you, like, bar trick magic. Nah. Where you can just, like, pull things off on a countertop. I don't think it's cool. I mean, it's, in theory, but it's also, like, because to do magic, you have to, like, walk up to people and be like, watch me do magic. It's kind of like the chugging thing, you know? Right, right. But if you just do it, like, at your table and you're not, like, showing off in front of anybody, if you're, like, if you just casually make a quarter disappear through a table and pull it out the other side, that can be kind of cool. I don't know if this is cool, but I know the opposite is very uncool. It's very uncool to not be able to shuffle cards. Yes. I was just going to say being able to shuffle really fast is yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, It's very cool. But, yeah. like, I, I actually judge people who can't shuffle cards. I don't know if there's anyone here in this room. I know how to shuffle. Yeah, yeah. I can't. You can't? No. Not cool. I can Ugh. bread and butter shuffle nothing fancy. Bread and, bread butter. and butter shuffle? Just like just like, running the power sweep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's that's shuffling cards. Nice. What about what about tipping a dealer? That always looks cool when you're just like, hey, this is for you, and you toss him a chip. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, uh, having like horse tips is cool. If you actually have a winning horse tip, that's a very cool thing to have. That's kind of like a knowing a guy. Like I got a tip about a having horse. Having frosted tips. Frosted yeah. tips are cool. Knowing how to drive stick shift. Yes. Stick shift cool. Good yep. job, Billy. That's actually a great one. I really wish I knew how to drive stick shift. Putting a plane in your bio on social media. Cool. People are like, wow, that, that cool. person has been on an aircraft. Going to Coachella. Yeah. Yeah, cool. just Coachella in general. Yeah, Coachella and, and all of its uh, adjacent vibes. Bribing someone. 
this kind of goes with what Hank was saying, like a doorman. If you if you just like slip a doorman casually yeah, yeah, yeah. at twenty, that's not really they, a bribe. They, they no, yeah. Yeah. Bribing government officials. Yes. Yeah, bribing. Yeah, that's that's cool. also cool. Yeah, no tipping. <sighs> A lot tipping, is cool. Tipping someone who usually doesn't get tipped is cool. Yeah, like like tipping, like throwing uh, the valet like a hundred dollar bill. That's a cool move. Yeah, or like Ray Liotta at the start of Goodfellas walking through the restaurant yep. in the back. And he's just like handing out hundreds to the kitchen manager. Yes, that's yes. cool. Um, anything else? I mean, that was a good that was a good Mount Rushmore. I feel like we got a little bit of our mojo back. Start. I hope we haven't done that one before. I don't there think there's a have. couple things we said that made me think we might have. But I don't think we've we done would power, never do that. We've done power, power moves, moves before, which definitely is different. different. Definitely different. Definitely different. I hope. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Jake's looking it up right what now. About having a, There's definitely going to be, I can guarantee you that uh, parallel parking is going to be on the fire moves and probably, and probably fixing shit. <laughs> probably. <laughs> what about um, like shit. having a real sick bitchin' aftermarket stereo sound system in your car? Yep. Cool. Spoilers. Yeah, spoil. Yeah, cool. aftermarket modifications. Putting an aquarium inside of your van. Oh, dude, cool. in qu aquariums. Oh, this was this was awesome 2016 before we even did the graphic. Oh, and shit. we're good. Yeah, I don't see a graphic. Oh. Is it for cool stuff? So the real ones, the cool cool move. Knowing that we might have done something similar to this and not complaining about it on Twitter. Here's, here's a here's a throwback, PFT. If you can explain this tweet. Yep. Uh, PMT. The, the Twitter said today's Mount Rushmore's power moves. What would you put on yours? And you said. Threatening to suspend your employees if they don't want to hang out with you and talk about Al Jazeera. Mm. I don't. Mm. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I don't mean either. I mm. think. I'm trying to put myself back in 2016. Get it. Get it. Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. Yeah. Threatened to suspend everybody because of Al Jazeera. Yes. What? No, the Al Jazeera report. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, the steroid report? Yeah. You can say it. You don't have to speak in codes here. Remember Al Jazeera did a whole investigation into the NFL? Yes. And then I think um, hey, Goodell. Hey. When someone puts a gun to your head and you tell them to shoot. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. <laughs> That's fucking cool. Who said or that? Or reversing a gun uh, to your head. Broken Atlanta fan. Yeah, that is cool. That's August fucking 2016. cool. 2016. Yeah, go ahead, shoot, go ahead, bitch. Shoot. You won't. <laughs> yeah. That is fucking cool. Yeah, because what's the worst thing that happens? You die, and then... You're dead, so you don't remember that you died. Yeah. But if the alternative is that he doesn't shoot, and then you're cool. Well, even or if, even if he does or he shoot, shoots, th then you're brain dead. It, yeah. Or even if he does shoot you, then you're like, yeah, I told that person to do that. That person followed my instructions. Yes, right. I'm the alpha. I'm the alpha. Yeah. For <laughs> in your last I'm, dying breath, you're like, I got him. I'm dead, but you, you know what? I'm the boss. I, as my brains bleed out of my head, <laughs> I'd be like, you'll do whatever I say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another score, another dub. <laughs> man, out on a win. Rare, rare dub for the Winning big man. Winning streak on the way out. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to say Philly. All right. That was a good Mount Rushmore. Uh, let's get to our interviews. We have Tom Fernelli and then Ken Burns. Tom Fernelli is brought to you by our friends at Coors Light. Coors Light is the greatest beer of all time. It is the official beer slowing down summer, which is ending soon. Enjoy this last weekend of summer. Slow it down with a crisp Refreshing Coors Light. Coors Light is cold lager, cold filter, and cold package. It's literally made to chill. It's as crisp and refreshing as the Colorado Rockies. Perfect for a moment to unwind this summer. When you crack open a Coors Light, it is the best feeling in the world. And Coors Light is so cold. Those mountains are blue. Tweet us your mountains. Show us your mountains. We'll retweet them. I love to see the mountains on a weekend. Coors Light is the official beer slowing down summer because of the beer that's made to chill. We want you to savor every second of summer. Get Coors Light in the new look delivered straight to your door with Drizzly or Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash take. CoorsLight.com slash take. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden Colorado, Colorado. Thank you to Coors Light, our wonderful sponsor. Here he is, Tom Fernelli. Here I am. Okay, we now welcome on our very good friend. It is Tom Fernelli. He is a writer, podcaster, talker of sports, CBS Sports. Uh, you can also find him on the Cover 3 podcast. He's got picks all the time. He's got college football all the time. He's one of the greatest college football minds of our time. Uh, Tom, nothing I said was untrue there. I want to start because usually when we do like college football previews, everyone asks like, oh yeah, like Alabama and Clemson, they're going to be in again. Let's do something different. Who is going to be the worst power five team in the country this year? Oh, that's a good question, but it's Kansas. Kansas? It's okay. Kansas. You, wait, you didn't let me finish and you can't say Kansas. Oh shit. Um, 
I would go worst power five. I think it could be Duke. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, shame. Like, I just think they've been trending in the wrong direction the last years. David Cutcliffe probably like they had a couple like nine, 10 win seasons there for a while where things were going really well, but they've been going the wrong direction ever since. And I just feel like the worst teams that had been the terrible teams in the ACC have all improved and Duke hasn't. So there's, there's a real chance that they go like winless in the conference. What is it about Duke? Because I know that the Mannings used to go down there and throw all the time. What is it about Cutcliffe? Like, is he really a quarterback guru or is he the guy that orders the stuff from the black market and they go down and spend a week in his dorm room. And then next thing you know, they come back healthier than ever next year. And Daniel Jones. And Daniel Jones. Uh, yeah, it could be that. I think it's just more than anything. I think, especially a while ago, Dan, uh, David Cutcliffe was just a very good quarterback coach. And But I think these days, Cutcliffe's probably specialty is more with like the kind of QBs you think of with the Mannings, where they're they're kind of in the pocket. You're not really looking at them as mobile guys. And I think that now that the game's changing to where it's more of a spread up tempo, you need a guy who can throw and run. I don't know if Cut, as great of a coach as he is, is as in tune to to develop those guys as he used to be okay so this made me think of something which i i never really kind of uh thought about with college football but we we always are talking about the guys that are coming home so to speak the scott frost the jim mm -hmm. harbaugh they get that extra year they get that extra bump because you know they're failing but they're the golden sun and hopefully they'll turn it around i just realized that there's also a class of coaches that coach non-traditional powerhouses that have a little bit of success and that could then get to hang on for an extended period of time where everyone kind of forgets about them. So Cliff is in that category. David Shaw with Stanford would be in that category. Mm -hmm. I would say Gary like Patterson at TCU. Like these guys had some really good years and now I'm thinking about, it, I'm like, wait, they haven't done anything in a while. Yeah, no, it, I think that definitely happens. But I think with like a situation like Cutcliffe, no, no disrespect, but as Hank can tell you, like at Duke, I feel like if you're the football coach, you're kind of flying under the radar anyway, because I don't know how many people there are really paying attention to the football right. program as mm -hmm. compared to basketball. But with, with Stanford, I think Shaw had a ton of great success early and things have waned off. And I do wonder if the clock isn't kind of ticking on there because it used to be like every season you would hear, oh, David Shaw is getting some NFL interest. He might mm -hmm. be leaving for an NFL job. You don't hear that much anymore. So yeah. I don't know if that's a bad side for Shaw. And then, as you mentioned with Gary Patterson, it's just, I mean, the dude took TCU from the whack to the Mountain West and then did so well that they got a spot in the Big 12 in a Power 5 program. So I think that bought him quite a bit of credit and time there. Yeah, yeah, and speaking of Kansas, Mangino might have been the ultimate example of that. He had, like, one good season. Everybody's like, this guy this guy is a genius. One of the best Italian college coaches of all time, would <laughs> you say? Not a pervert. Not a pervert. No, are, definitely are not you, a pervert. What, where would you put yourself on the spectrum? Because it is a spectrum like the Kinsey scale. Are you more Italian than pervert? I think the best Italians all have a little pervert in them. But <laughs> I think that I, I probably, uh, on the spectrum, I'm closer to Italian than pervert. The older I get, the closer I get to Italian and the less pervert there is. I like That's it. good. I uh, like the setup that you got right now. You, you, There's a base in the background that you have displayed there. You look like the ultimate. You look like a, a late 90s bass player right now. Like you, you're the understudy for Fieldy in Corn or something. Yes, <laughs> that that actually, if you'd have told like 19 year old me, I'd have been like, oh my god, thank you, thank you, I've made it. <laughs> All right, let's do something here where uh, we have the presumptive favorite in each conference, most conferences at this point in in college football. It's, I mean, it is what it is. Like college football is, there's a few teams that are incredible and they're above everyone else. So let's go through it. So. Uh, Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Oregon, all expected to win their conferences. Give me this team that you could see winning each of those conferences out of nowhere. I think Florida in the SEC is being like pretty slept on. I know from a talent level, they're not at the Georgia, Alabama, or even the Texas A&M level, but you look at Dan Mullen and what he's always been able to do with teams, even with less talent, like I think that you're looking at Mike Leach at Mississippi State right now, and I think that a lot of people kind of take for granted the success that Mullen had there and how hard and difficult that job is. And we saw Leach struggle last year. And I think Mullen, you know, they lose Kyle Trask, they lose Kyle Pitts, but he's still a very bright offensive mind, and they still do have plenty of talent. So I think that's a team that could surprise in the SEC, in the ACC. I really don't think there's another team. I'll yeah. say North Carolina, but I, I just don't. I don't think anybody in that conference besides Clemson loses, you know, fewer than three games. Mm -hmm. uh, Big Ten. 
Wisconsin? I mean, oh. I'm not trying to kiss it, no, your I, ass. I was setting you up for that. Yeah, no, I, go ahead. <laughs> but it's just like nobody in the East can keep up with Ohio State for a full season because Ohio State's too good. So it's like you just have to if you if you win the West and you get to the Big Ten title game, you have a good day. Maybe you pull off the upset. And I think Wisconsin's the favorite in the West in the Big 12. I would take Texas before I took Iowa State. I really? Think Iowa, yeah, I, I just think from a talent level, they're very good. I think that Steve Sarkeesian coming in, we saw what he was able to do with the Alabama offense. And I think B. John Robinson is a perfect fit. Like for what we saw Najee Harris doing that Alabama offense last year, I think B. John's a better player than Najee Harris. So I think that could be really beneficial. I just think Iowa State really kind of overperforms its expectations. And that kind of causes us to overinflate our own expectations for them. But they're coming off a nine and three season and that was pretty or a 10 win season. And we're pretty much asking them to now have the greatest season in program history. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's as likely as Texas. And if I'm, we're talking to pac 12 team besides Oregon, I you, can't pick USC. I just have no faith in Clay Helton. So I'll just say Utah. Screw it. Okay. Cause I was going to say, you could just say whichever team plays Oregon in like, I don't know, let's say the second week of November. That will be the team that will win the pack because they'll yes. just that's that's just what the Pac-12 does every year. They just yes. eat themselves alive. The Iowa State thing though is kind of shocking to me because they are the darling right now of all the previews and everyone's saying Matt Campbell, Matt Campbell, Matt Campbell, and they deserve it because they're coming off a great year. But I like this the z the zag on that is that Texas could be back. Yeah, I mean because like okay now I guess I'll insult you. Iowa State is Wisconsin. It is a eh. team. It's a team with a great coaching staff who takes some unheralded t talent out of high school, develops them, coaches them extremely well, and is a team that can win nine, ten games. They compete, but they're not really a team that you think of as a playoff contender. Okay, or, that's what, that, what you just said was like the exact opposite of Texas. Yeah, but you know, you're Wisconsin. But, you have to say with Iowa State. Wisconsin is Iowa State on steroids. Then you can say, yeah, well, yes, because yes, because yes. Wisconsin's uh, hey, Wisconsin's recruiting has really kind of yes. kicked it to another level in recent yes. years. So yes. that's not that crazy to say. But yeah, Texas, I know it's so fucking dumb. Like we get stuck in the Texas is back narrative every year. And I'm telling you, the narrative is really it's been stupid and overplayed and I haven't been on it. But this year. I just really think now there's like, you know, like when you're on Twitter and there's the backlash to the backlash. Mm hmm. I think the expectations for Texas year this year are the backlash to the always being overrated, and I think we're just kind of writing them off a little too easily because I think that their QB that they just named the starter, he is a very talented player. He's a dual threat. He gives Steve Sarkeesian more that he can use, and he'll make that offense more dynamic. As I said, Bijan Robinson, I think, is a great running back. They have a good offensive line. There are questions at receiver that do concern me. I think somebody needs to step up there, but on the defensive side of the ball, they're really talented, too, and you can't ignore, like, last year, all the crap that was going on off the field with like the eyes of Texas stuff and just the Tom Herman and having to deal with all the Kings of Texas and all the boosters that they have, they're pulling all the strings. I think that Sark comes in with a fresh start. They've got a fresh, you know, if everybody's got a fresh start, I think that they're very talented and I think that they're a very good team. And I think we're going to see a good season from the Longhorns. I still think Oklahoma is the best team in the big 12 by far. Right. But I think this is a Texas team that could be very good. So all that said, are you still going chalk? Like if you're looking at the top four, the presumptive four that are going to be there at the end of the year and, and hold their serve for the entire season. Are you going with that? Or are you saying that there's going to be somebody else like one of these Florida teams or, or uh, you know, one of the ones that you had mentioned, definitely not Clemson. It sounds like that one is pretty much in cement. But uh, besides that, outside of those, if there were to be one that would sneak in, who's the most likely? I am doing the least chalky chalk I can as far as my official predictions. I've got my playoff being Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, and Oregon. Smart. Because I do th I, like if you want to, it's it makes you seem like you're trying something different when you're still just picking another favorite to get there. But like, I think Oregon, since Mario Cristobal has come there, the recruiting that they've done, it's like what Urban Meyer did at Ohio State when he got to the Big Ten. It's what Dabo's been doing with Clemson and the ACC, where they're just recruiting at an entirely different level. They're bringing an SEC recruiting mindset to a conference that does not have it. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the conference, USC keeps up because USC is USC, and they could just pull players based on that. But even that's kind of fading under Clay Helton right now. And Oregon, the talent disparity between them and everybody else is so huge that I think that the, even if they lose to Ohio State, they could still run the table in the conference. And then if they're sitting there with one loss and they're only lost at the end of the year is Ohio State, they got a good shot of getting in. Yeah, Oregon is pulling, like, guys from L.A., which, you know, I mean, Chip Kelly, when he was at his peak, was doing that. But it was also, like, a different 
kind of style. Like Cristobal, I mean, the line they is might, oh, he's one of the best line coaches, probably the best yeah. line coach in in college football. And they might have the number one pick in the NFL draft on their defensive line in Kayvon Thibodeau. He's a tremendous player. He is the, probably the best pass rusher in the country. And you know what's funny? There's another kid on that defense, Justin Flo, a linebacker. He might be better than Thibodeau in the long run. Yeah, I like Maybe. that. Most important player. Nice. Yeah. Not bad. So it's they're just they are just that talented. And I feel like the only question is Mario Cristobal can't get in his own way. He can be a little too conservative in offense. Like we saw Justin Herbert at Oregon like put up mediocre numbers year after year. And then he gets to the NFL and all of a sudden he's he's great because he's in an offense that says, Hey, look at we got a talented QB. We should take advantage of it. Yeah. So that Auburn game still hurts me. The Bo Nix when everyone's like, Bo Nix is good. No, he's not. Where, where do you <laughs> no, he's not. where yeah. do you stand on the idea that uh we talked about this at Kirk Herb Street last week? One of these teams, one of the you know, if if Cincinnati runs a table, they go undefeated. Are they going to get in over a team that has one loss from Power Five? No, a group of five teams. As long as the playoff stays at four teams, mm -hmm. a group of five teams never getting in. Period. I don't care who they play or what. The, we have to remember who put the playoff together. Yeah, the Power Five. Why did they put it together? For money. Mm -hmm. They are not going to willfully share that money with a Cincinnati. Yeah. Or a Boise State, or anybody. Sounds and, like you just talked your way into our steak dinner. Yeah. So you can in. come along when we're correct and Kirk is wrong. I, we're just going to expand the dinner over the course of the year. I also think Kirk did that because <laughs> be he's got a, you know, like he, Kirk is good at his job and he knows that, you know, petting the belly of the group of five is not the worst thing to do if you're a national, you know, TV guy. So it was smart for him. I just don't, I never see it happening. Like it just, it can't happen. The fact that, uh, UCF, what did they even finish that year? Like eighth or something? Like, yeah. like, it's crazy. They're so far away from it. It's not like they finished fifth. So it's it's just, it's never going to happen. Tom, we're in an in alliance um, as members of the Big Ten. How much did that make you feel better about uh, the world of college football? Because I have to admit, right, like SEC takes Texas and Oklahoma. The Pac-12, ACC, and Big Ten are saying, we got to do something. Let's create an alliance that makes no sense. No one knows what it's about, but I kind of feel better about it. I don't know. Oh, yeah. The best night of sleep I ever had <laughs> after the uh, the formation of the alliance, which I, th I, I don't know what it does. Like, they, <laughs> they, does they've nothing. talked about... Yeah, they've talked about like it's like well we're going to have like we're, we're working on a scheduling agreement that for the future between the three conferences. Oh, does that mean you're not going to schedule the SEC? Well, no, no, we could keep scheduling the SEC. So it's just going to be the same thing that you've always been doing, but now you're going to have maybe a cool logo that you could put on yeah. a press release to announce it. And that's literally all it is. It's the same thing with like the Big 12 yesterday announcing that hey, we are thinking of expansion. We are. We we've we've been talking about that. It's it's very much like I just want to look like I'm doing something, so people don't think I'm doing nothing. Yeah, it it, it it's it, I liked it, likened it to like the first night of Real World when the guy is like gets really drunk and then just yes. hooks up with like whoever's closest to him, and then the next morning he's like, I think I might be in love, and then the next <laughs> morning he's like, Wait, we're we're on this show together for three months here. Like they just had to find someone to to get in bed with. Like the Big yeah. Ten, ACC, and Pac and Pac twelve just had to find a relationship to fill that hole instantly because it was a new environment and they were scared. Yeah, and by episode three, they're screaming at each other, and yes. every single other roommate hates them. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's but you're right. It's basically like one fifty a.m. It's a Saturday night. The bar is <laughs> closing down. Yeah. They just turn the lights on. They look across the room and they're like. Alliance, yeah. Let's, let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do I, it. I, I like where Tom's head's at, though. Where it's like, there's so many people that work in marketing for these large football organizations, and they have to have ideas that they bring to the table, which mm -hmm. is how the legends and leaders division of, of the big got split up a couple years ago. And somebody just had like a PowerPoint. They're like, I got a big presentation, and they're like, we should do this alliance. They're like, I like that. I like that's very progressive, forward thinking on your part. But in reality, it's just. People that want to justify their own jobs. Yeah, there was there was some intern there. This was their big break. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> I did feel better though for about 30, 30 minutes. I was like, "Ooh, like looks like we're good. We got an alliance. Everything's going to stabilize." And then I realized like this actually means nothing. Um, so how about let's do a, a gambling trend that you're looking at this year, something that uh, has piqued your interest that you want to hammer, Hank? 
But, uh, so you guys oh. know I. Uh, sorry, Tom. He asked me. Uh, you guys know I love underdogs. Uh-huh. This is the first season. This is obviously the COVID year. It's the first time fans are back in the crowd. Yep. yep. Uh, mm-hmm. In games involving FBS schools, last week, week zero, home teams are four and one. It's probably a big reason why Illinois pulled off the upset. Illinois, uh, <laughs> Illinois. Yeah. So I'm gonna be looking for for home teams, underdogs. Ah. Uh. That's my trend of the week. That's okay, great. Hey. Hank's, Hank's wow. trend of the week. Hank I like is locked that. In. And what was yours, Tom? Sorry, we cut you off. I'm just going to take overs. <laughs> God damn it. Firing on every single over I could find. That's oh. smart. Uh, Tom, I, I got a take that I'm trying to get out in front of here. Before I want to be the first person that I hear say it, but maybe you can back me up and tell me that I'm not insane for thinking this. All right. Penn State, Wisconsin. Wisconsin wins by double figures. James Franklin, hot seat. True or false? I think, yeah. I, yes. I, 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 I mean, not like – not. I- imminent kind of hot seat but i do think Warm. that f yeah it would definitely there would start you'd start hearing murmurs because like penn state you know last year was obviously a disaster for them but it was a terrible situation for them because you know they had a couple of their key players like micah parsons opt out because of the covid stuff then they lost a couple players to injuries just before the season began so like they came into the year missing key players on both sides of the ball obviously it took them a long time to adjust although that said you would think that with the talent level they had they probably still should have won a few of those games they got things together late but this is a Penn State team that the expectation is to be competing with Ohio State and Mm -hmm. maybe you're not beating them every single year but to be fair Penn State's kind of entering that same territory where Michigan is where it's like they really don't have a chance in hell like when you look at the teams compared to each other, particularly at the QB spot, they can't match up with them and they're getting run every single year. So at some point, if James Franklin, if, if they lose Wisconsin and it looks like they're already kind of out of it in going into the second week of the year, yeah, you're going to start hearing whispers about and, that. And the best part is James Franklin could be on the hot seat at Penn State and then just go get the job at USC. And. Uh, we we talked about this on the Cover 3 podcast all last year. I think James Franklin would be magnificent at USC Agreed. because the one thing at USC that you really need to take advantage of, if your goal is to win national titles, if your goal is to just have a solid football team filled with great guys all graduating and doing wonderful things, fine, whatever, more power to you. But if you want to compete for national titles, you need to recruit. You need a guy who's really going to try to bring that talent in like Pete Carroll was doing and like you see what all the top programs are doing in USC has a great recruiting area to work in. There's a ton of talent in Southern California. If you look at all these top quarterbacks in the country, they're almost all coming from California, but none of them are staying in California. So I think if you got the right guy, the right kind of figurehead who can recruit and bring that talent there and then surround himself with a good coaching staff, I think USC could once again be one of the powers in the country. And I think James Franklin's one of the guys who's capable of doing it, to be blunt. And on top of all that, I think USC is one of the only jobs in college football where you kind of need to be a self promoter. Like you kind of want, you kind of have to be semi a pseudo celebrity. Mm-hmm. You want to ha- want that a little bit and be in the mix and like yeah. hobnobbing with rich people and and going to Lakers games and stuff. You kind of yeah, have to James have Franklin, that vibe. Yeah, and he has he, that. He, he's got that juice. Clay yeah. Helton does not. No, definitely not. And Clay, Clay, I love Clay Helton though because the no- I, he, yeah. like they like forgot to fire him three years ago, and he's just like. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to win nine games, so what do you want me to do? Like, <laughs> like people think, like, I'm, I'm rough on Clay Heltner. People think I'm rough, but it's like I was saying at the beginning. It's, I don't think, it's not that I think he's a bad coach. It's just I think that USC should be competing for national titles, yes. and I don't think Clay Helton is a national title coach because I think he's just a good football coach instead of what USC needs to get there. Clay Helton would be a, would be a great coach at, uh, let's say, Purdue. He'd be a great yeah. coach at Purdue. He'd Colorado. Be a, yeah, he'd be a great yeah. coach at Colorado. He would be a great coach. I don't know. He'd be. A, he's a good program builder. He's a good yeah. culture builder. It's just he's not. He doesn't have that he national go to title talent. Yeah, cool. something like that. That yeah. that's where Clay Helton should be. Um, all right, let's talk about this weekend slate. Uh, the big game, obviously, Clemson versus Georgia. Tell me who, like, who you're going to bet on, or if you're not going to bet on it, who you're leaning towards, and then also. Is it fair to say that Kirby Smart kind of needs this one? Not hot seat because they have, you know, Georgia rolling, but more in the Georgia has the talent to be on the upper echelon level. Mm -hmm. The coaching hasn't always met that talent in the big game. Yeah, that's I don't I don't know if he'll be on the hot seat if they lose, because I do think that it being Clemson, as long as they don't get blown out, I think he'll he'll be fine. But I I get what you're saying. I do think Georgia is going to win this game, though. Oh, and. 
I don't have a great feel. I'm betting Georgia plus the three. I'm not betting them on the money line. But for me, it's just like these are similar teams. DJ Uyunglele is a very good QB. JT Daniels is a very good QB. I think that the rest of the offense, I have questions about both teams at the receiver spot. I think both defenses are terrific with the front seven. And I think Georgia's secondary is slightly better than Clemson's secondary, at least from a talent and athleticism angle. The difference to me is I think Georgia's offensive line is much better equipped to deal with Clemson's defensive front than Clemson's offensive line is with Georgia. So I think that over 60 minutes, that's probably going to push things towards the Georgia side. I do think it's going to be a close kind of interesting game, though. And I think that's really all any of us want. As long as it's not a blowout, I'll be fine. But I would, I'm would i leaning Georgia before anything. By the way, before Georgia fans get mad at me, I'm not saying Kirby Smart would be on the hot seat off of a loss here. There's varying degrees to what happens to mm-hmm. a coach. I think he would be tagged with can't win the big one if yeah. he lost this one badly. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's definitely been a problem and it's it's not even just that they've lost the games it's that there have been like when you think of like the overtime loss to Alabama and, and other losses that they've had there have been moments and decisions made by Kirby Smart which led seemingly directly to the outcome mm-hmm. of games changing and I think that's where it's really kind of that narrative is being Yeah. Going. So the other big variable is are they going to be wearing the black uniforms? I hope not. I hate those things. I hate them too. Yeah, but I, I can't I can't not bet on them when they're wearing the black uniforms. It just True. happens. It's just I, I kinda like lose I black out when they're wearing the blackout uniforms and they I look lose like control. the sharks from any given Sunday. So mm-hmm. you kinda yeah, you, you start hearing that Al Pacino speech and you're like, I gotta bet on that. Yeah, it just it gets me amped up. I, I wanna talk real quick about um stuff going on in the Big Ten right now and uh well we can get to Shiano in a little bit, but uh Maryland or do you have first of all is Maryland going to finish behind Rutgers this year? I don't think so. They could. If they do, I won't be shocked. I just at, Maryland is a really difficult team to read because it's been the same case for the last most of the last decade honestly where it's like I look at that roster and I see the way that they're recruited I'm like, man, there's a lot of talent on there, but they never really play to their talent level and they're always kind of they're always very inconsistent from week to week. I think Talia Tagovailoa is talented, but I also think he's wildly inconsistent and sometimes makes some really strange decisions that could really cost you games. But compared to Rutgers, it's just I think Shiano's doing a very good job of bringing that program up to at least standard for being a bad Big Ten team and not just a terrible team overall. It's high praise. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, the, the program Shiano yeah. took over was in very bad shape, but I think he's already improved it considerably. And the way they're recruiting, I think, in the next few years, they're going to be pretty damn decent. But I think right now Maryland's probably better. It's – it's you're, you're right on Rutgers. It's like there's definitely a big difference. They might not win a lot of games, but there's a big difference with what Shiano is going to They're competent even ha- looking. Right. They're not going to – there was a stretch there where when Rutgers played – Wisconsin, Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, it was it was guaranteed 50 to 7. No matter mm-hmm. what. It was just every single time that was going to be the score. I actually have Rutgers circled as the game to break my heart this year cuz I looked at the schedule for the Badgers and that would be off of beating Iowa, basically solidifying the Big 10 West and then going to Piscataway at like noon on the next week and somehow watching an entire game and being like, they're not going to lose this game. They're not going to lose this game. No way they lose this game. And then they lose that game. That would be a very Shiano thing to do. And yeah. a very Wisconsin thing to do as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, how are we feeling about Burt, my man Burt, who I actually – I don't hate him anymore. I hated him for a while. <laughs> But uh, he's just funny, and he he has Illinois playing like that drive that he had against Nebraska uh, in the second half. The, I think it started the third quarter. That mm-hmm. was Bielema ball. And when Bielema yeah. ball, like there's something about Bielema ball that I just, even though we've been through it with him, like I, I kind of just still love him because he just bullies you and grinds you up, and it's fun to watch when it's humming. Yeah, the, the honeymoon has not ended yet because, I mean, since he took over the job from Ovi, like, one of the reasons Lovey Smith was let go, besides the not winning games part, was that the recruiting, especially in the state of Illinois, had completely dropped off. There was none for the most part. And like high school coaches were very open in telling you, it's like, dude, they don't even show up here, let alone, you know, offer our kids. So the first thing he does, he comes in, he, he does the Burt thing where he completely establishes himself with the high school. We've already seen a huge uptick in recruiting the home state kids. I think that as far as the actual roster, he's he, he inherited an experienced roster and there was talent on it. So I think that he was lucky to step into the right situation. But I think that they've changed to an offense, like you said, the Bielema ball, which is better suited for the Big Ten. I, I think that part of the problem at Nebraska, like with Scott Frost, 
like that kind of spread offense. We've seen numerous teams try it in the Big Ten. Illinois was just doing it with in the Lovey Smith era. Scott Frost is doing it in Nebraska now. Jeff Brom's been trying to do it at Purdue. Rich Rod tried to do it at Michigan all those years ago. It very seldom works unless you're Purdue with Drew Brees. Yeah. And there aren't a lot of Drew Breeses around. And I think that there's a specific style, particularly in the West, that works. And Illinois has adopted to that quickly on the offensive side of the ball, which I think is good. And on the defense, they're not just playing cover three all the time. Like with Lovey trying to force turnovers once you get to the red zone. They are they played a ton of man last week. They mix it up. They've switched more of a three four. Attention to Scott Frost if you're listening. They play both odd and even man fronts. <laughs> and it's just been really good. And it's kind of like the Rutgers situation where watching that game on Saturday against Nebraska was the first time in a very long time I watched an Illini football game and felt that our coach was out coaching the other team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and good luck. And I hope that uh you know, you know where this is leading, right? Like, mm-hmm. Brett Bielema has a tattoo of a Hawkeye on his on his ankle. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. So I just that's okay because he's you guys are going to like go to a couple bowl games, and then it's going to be he's going to Iowa. I don't think that I don't. He might. I can't rule it out. He but is. He is. Come on. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he's already kind of being a pain in Iowa's ass right now with some of the in-state okay, recruiting. Okay. Oh, wait, okay. Are, are you saying that if if he goes on a nice little run here at Illinois? that he's going to be like head coach for life. You think Bielema is going to settle down at Illinois? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he could definitely leave for Iowa. That's the thing, like, cause that's the alma mater, but I, I feel like the pay at power five jobs now, it's like, unless, unless you're Ohio state, Alabama, or one of those programs, like the rest of the power five are all pretty much the same deal. Yeah. Yeah. Or a Texas A&M that, that was actually a slap in Jimbo's face. They didn't go the full 10 years, 10, 10 million a year. They went, 10 years, 94 million. Like, where was Jimbo going? <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I mean, true. I understand. I understand, like, the urge to, when coming off a great season, you want to, maybe you want to reward your coach for having a great season. And Jimmy Sexton, this was part of the problem at Florida State. Every time Jimbo had a good year, Jimmy Sexton, his agent, would come to Florida State seeking a raise. And eventually, Florida State just got to the point where it's like, no, nah, man, come on. Like, how much do you want us to pay him? But he's at Texas A&M. He's got a huge deal. I think it's still got six years left on it. There are very (laughs) few teams that could take him away from College Station that would make sense or even offer him the money where the job is open. Maybe USC, but I don't know if Jimbo Fisher's really a fit for USC. Like, so why are you giving him an extra whatever year? Like, look at look at what just is happening at Nebraska. You give Scott Frost an extension that he didn't really deserve, and there was no need to give him because nobody's coming. You see it time and time again at all these programs. Coaches keep getting extended. They keep getting raises when there's no other jobs on the table. And then a year later, they have a bad season, and you want to fire him, and you can't because the buyout is ridiculous. So shout out to Jimbo. I'm happy you got it. Texas A&M, you don't have to give it to him every time Jimmy Sexton asks. (laughs) But it it is kind of nice as an athletic director to just, you know, not have to worry about a coach for a while. It's like, yeah, I may have messed up paying him this much money, but at least I don't have to, you know, get back out on the market in a couple of years. And to be fair, most ADs probably like if you give Jimbo Fisher a ten year deal, like, are you even going to be there at the end of that ten years? Probably not. Right, probably not. Yeah. So you're, yeah, you as the Twitter thread said, like, you don't really want to be out here. They're pegging out here right now. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it's not as great as you think it is when you're in the market. Yes. What, what about? Uh, can you talk me down from Indiana? Because I've kind of fallen yeah. in love with Indiana uh, just based on the fact that they won games that were on primetime last year. And I saw them on my television, and their quarterback's name is Penix. I know it's yes. Penix, but uh, there are a lot of intangibles that work their way into the mindset of an idiot like myself, where now I'm thinking, like, Indiana could actually do some damage should we take them seriously. Tag me in if you need my help, Tom, because I have, I've gone to war with Indiana football fans. <laughs> Well, plus Indiana has receivers named Wap, Phil Yor, and Ty Freifogel. How could you not fall in love with that team? But I no, they're not going to be nearly as good as they were last year. I, I think that I think Tom Allen has done a fantastic job of improving that team to a level that we're not accustomed to seeing from Indiana football. And I think that they are I think they're taking advantage of Michigan State being in somewhat of a downturn and they've entered that point where they're the fourth team clearly and maybe even the third best team in that division, but I think that there's some numbers from last year's team, and I've I've been getting killed by Indiana fans since last year because of it. They were very lucky when it came to turnovers, or at least yes. points off of turnovers. Like they forced them and they turned them into points, which is awesome. 
it's just it's not a reliable thing to count on game in and game out and year in and year out. So there's likely to be some aggression. So I think Indiana's still a good team. I think they're going to get to a bowl game easily. They'll probably win eight games, but anything more than that, I think you're kind of deluding yourself. Indiana had a great year last year. Indiana, Tom Allen is a very good coach. They're going in the right direction. But if you actually look at their season last year, they beat Penn State on a on a play that okay, whatever. And some really dumb decisions by Penn State's yeah, fault too. Yeah, they, they beat Rutgers, who's terrible. They beat Michigan, who's was terrible. They beat Michigan State, who was terrible. Like everyone had a down year when they caught Indiana, and then they lost b- final score seven to Ohio State. But we that game was not a seven point game. It mm-hmm. was. Ohio State could have just done whatever they wanted. They got bored. They beat Wisconsin. Yes, I will throw that out there. It was 14-6 in a Wisconsin team that was (laughs) horrendous, like offensively horrendous down the stretch, like one of the worst offensive Wisconsin teams I've seen in a long time. So everything broke right. They had a great year. I'm not taking anything away. I'm just going to – I'm just – taking a nice cold shower on Indiana football, winning 10 games and competing for the East. Yeah, no, it's you're you're dead on. I, I again, I think they're a good team, but they're they're not the team you saw last year, and to expect that going forward. But it's, it's still like if Indiana goes eight and four, yeah, and you're an great. Indiana fan. Yes, hell great. yeah, man. Yes, yes. That's the thing is I'm good never. For I'm you. Not, yeah, I think my when I got my big argument, it was like it was actually nice because it was a random I think day in the spring. It was like oh, we're talking college football, but it was essentially like Indiana fans being like we've arrived. Like, like Wisconsin's days are past. I'm like, we, you have to do it for more than one COVID year. To, to, to their defense, like, they've had some rough times with the basketball program lately, so they're just clinging to anything it's they true. get their hands on. It's true. All right, let's uh, leave with this, Tom. Give us – so every every week Tom has uh, his, his pick, pick six on CBS Sports. He does picks. He's great, sharp, handicapper. Can you give us one that you love? Uh, my lock of the week this week is actually Illinois minus four and a half at home against UTSA. That is a straight up disrespectful line. Love it. I think UTSA is one dimensional on offense. They have a great running back in Sincere McCormick, but the Illini defense completely shut down Nebraska's run game last week. And if they could do that to Nebraska's offensive line, I don't have too many concerns with them doing it to UTSA's offensive line. And if they make UTSA beat them through the air, I just don't think UTSA could do it. So to get that at under a touchdown, it's like, I don't think Illinois is some juggernaut now because it beat Nebraska, but they are definitely a touchdown better than UTSA. And Dan, I mean, you can remember Brett Bielema teams at Wisconsin in the non-con playing against yes. group of five teams. They Killed don't show them. any mercy. They just Killed crush them. them. Yeah. Those were the best days because it was when you were super drunk in a September Madison day when it was still hot out. And, mm-hmm. You know, just put up like 50 on a team and call it a day. Game's exactly. over by 2.30, you're good to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, Tom, you're the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Best of luck. Good to see uh, you. Gambling this season. And uh, Justin Fields prediction. Go quick. Uh, week three. Okay. Oh, but dude, Miles Garrett gonna fucking kill him. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of big guys in the NFL, Dan. <laughs> How's Aston Villa uh, doing? Are they better than Arsenal? Uh, I everybody's better than Arsenal. Yeah, I haven't looked at the uh, table recently. I don't know. Arsenal's bottom of the table. The, the uh, three of us are better than Arsenal. Yes, yes. Love no, it. That hurts. All right, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Tom Fernelli was brought to you by our great friends over at Sling. If you love watching live sports, and I'm sure that you do, but you're tired of paying high prices, it's time to take control of your TV experience and get Sling. It's live TV starting at 35 bucks, only 10 bucks for your first month. At Sling, you get your favorite channels, including NFL Red Zone, SEC Network, Golf Channel, and more. They all come together for less. And starting right now, right now, Sling gives you access to the new Barstool Sports channel exclusively on Sling. The contact from Barstool that you love with some brand new exclusive content coming to our Sling channel and our Sling channel only. Whatever you're into, football, baseball, basketball, hockey, tennis, soccer, golf, cornhole, ping pong, Stool Stream Stadium, play Barstool app, Sling is where you can find the live sports you love all in one place. Go to sling.com slash barstool to sign up now. Get your first month starting at just 10 bucks at sling.com slash barstool. And now, here's Ken Burns. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. Uh, You know him. He's probably the most famous documentarian out there. He's an Emmy Award winner. He's got a new uh, documentary about Muhammad Ali coming out September 19th on PBS. It is Ken Burns. 
I want to actually start there because I was actually we're going to talk about Muhammad Ali in this documentary, but I was just finishing something up, and someone asked me, "Oh, who are you going to go interview?" And I said, "Ken Burns," and they said, "Wow, are you the most famous documentarian out there? Are you like you have actual?" When you say the word, the name Ken Burns, people are like, "Oh man, that's incredible." Well, you know, I live in a. It's very nice of you guys. I'm happy to be with you. I live in this tiny little town in in New Hampshire. I've lived here for 42 years, so I think I'm the most famous documentary filmmaker in this town. But uh, I'm I'm more interested in the content of the films rather than in the degree of bold face my name might have. And here, nobody gives a shit. You know, whether I shovel the the lawn of my neighbor if they're not doing well in a snowstorm gets me more props than you know. Emmy nominations or 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 uh, whatever it is, and that's a good way to be. And by the way, this film is co-directed by my daughter uh, Sarah Burns and her husband David McMahon. We work together on the Central Park Five and Jackie Robinson, and have now been together in this. So if I say we, it's not a pretentious royal we. It actually has to do with the two others that that made the film. And Sarah and Dave wrote the script, so maybe it's even more theirs than mine. So so how does that, can you explain that process to us? Uh, you know, documentaries, especially sports documentaries, have become kind of, you know, the 30 for 30 boom the last 10 years. How does the process work when you say, okay, here's a subject, you just mentioned a script. Like, wh can you just even explain the, the, the beginning stages of it for sure, people who might sure. not understand? Yeah, I, th I think we do it a little bit differently than others in, in our colleagues. I've been doing it for almost 50 years, and it doesn't really matter what the subject is, whether it's sports or it's war or it's presidents or it's artists or writers, whatever it might be. So the biggest thing is that most people have a set research followed by a set writing that produces a script that informs the shooting and editing, boom, done. We never stop researching and we never stop writing. So we're corrigible to the end. And so we're drawn to subjects and we're drawn to complicated subjects. We're not, we don't want to regurgitate what the conventional wisdom is or the baggage. What we want to do is share with you the process of discovery. And with somebody like Muhammad Ali, for whom there's been lots of films and lots of really good films made about specific fights, about a couple of uh, years in his life, about a fight with the US. We wanted to do something comprehensive from his birth and boyhood in Jim Crow segregated Louisville, Kentucky to his death by Parkinson's not that long ago, 2016. And honor the fights, but also honor his struggle with the government against the, about the war in Vietnam, honor his faith and his, his adhering to what was for many people, black as well as white, a reprehensible group called the Nation of Islam that was separatist, where the civil rights movement that was gaining a lot of traction was about integration. So there's lots of undertow and complication to the story of Muhammad Ali, and of course, when he refuses draft because of a faith-based decision, it's treated, because he's a black man in America, as a political thing and a big middle finger to America. So he's sort of the third strike. First strike is he's, he's gregarious and he's braggadocio. Second strike is he joins the Nation of Islam. Third strike, he refuses the draft and he's you know convicted, going to go to prison and loses three and a half years at the prime of his career. That alone is a great story and has been the subject, but we wanted to know who his mama was, who his dad was, you know, what it was like to see Emmett Till's open, mutilated, open casket, you know, body in that casket, which was about the same age, what it's like to, to grow up in segregated America, and then all these other things, family dynamics, uh, his evolving political and spiritual beliefs, you know, his friendship with Malcolm X, the loss of that friendship, how he treated Joe Frazier, and what happened happens inside those fights. So our secret weapon in the film is Michael Bent, this former heavyweight champion who like helps those of us who aren't boxing fans understand not just the strategy and tactics, but the psychology and this almost round around blow to blow uh, sense of what's happening, what's transpiring, who's got the bigger heart, who's got the bigger will, who wants it more. And I, I think it helps ease us into the 20, 25 fights that we sort of isolate from his extraordinary career and point out, not just the victories, but the, the you know, important uh, losses like to Joe Frazier and to Spinks and to Norton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Muhammad Ali is obviously a, a great American to tell this story about. Like, he's, there's so much rich stuff in his life that you can dig into. I'm curious to know, because going back through through the list of films that you've made, and there are a lot of great ones in there, has there ever been a subject that you felt really passionate about 
and then you start making it and you're like, you know what? Maybe this is just something I like a lot and maybe there's not enough to tell, you know, a full story about it in in the way that I usually like to tell these stories. Man, I've been so lucky. I'm knocking on wood because, you know, I've been doing this for almost 50 years and that hasn't happened yet. I mean, what I find people often say to me, man, you worked on Vietnam for 10 and a half years. Didn't you get bored? And in point of fact, or this one for seven years, didn't you get bored? The, it's bittersweet. I love this part, this evangelical part where I'm going out and saying, you got to watch this film because it's a way to mitigate a sorrow at leaving a project that you want to keep working on. You'd think that making a film is additive. It's like building a house, but it's subtractive. So this film is eight hours. We have 50 times eight hours of material. We have 400 hours of stuff. And all of it is important in somebody's world. And it's how you sort of, I guess since he was born in Kentucky, how you distill uh -huh. the essence mm -hmm. of that 400 hours down to 15 hours to make it and will still be criticized. Oh, you left this out. And I love that because man, if you make a 18 and a half hour film on baseball or an 18 hour film on Vietnam and people are complaining what you left out, you go, Phew, nobody's saying it's boring as hell. Yeah. Right. So is there the burns cut? Do you have like a special cut that you're going to drop no, in like six months? You know what? Months? The reason why I can spend 10 and a half years is I've spent my entire professional life um, working with PBS. So that's P is in public and S not in system them, but in service. And so they, if I raise the money, they allow me to take the time necessary to do it right. I could go to a streaming service. I could go to a premium cable and say with my track record, Hey, I need $30 million to do X and they'd give it to me, but they wouldn't give me 10 and a half years to do it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So every time you see a film, you're looking at a director's cut. In this case, Sarah Burns, David McMahon, and me. This is our director's cut. This was. This is how we thought it should be. And so our first episode goes well over two hours. Normally in broadcast television, you know, they cut your head off. And, and, and then some of them are, are a little bit short of the two hour time period. But we get to say, look, this is what, between these goalposts of episode one and, and the end of episode one, this is what the ground we had to cover. And you tell me where you can cut something and nobody's been ever, ever able to tell us where we could cut stuff. And then and conversely, I'm not gonna fill it out just to make your perfect timing. Yeah. And that's yeah. why PBS has been so great to us. Yeah. So when you started researching this and you started going through the different clips and talking to people, Muhammad Ali is such a fascinating character for a million different reasons. But from the sports angle and the shit talking angle, I've always been like, I, he, he might not have invented shit talking, but he's perfected it. <laughs> he and perfected. now, yeah, and now today's age, you see it a lot more, but it was something totally different then. Was there, like, watching all these clips, were you even taken aback like he was even better than I remembered or better, better than, than I thought? I, look, I, I'm old enough that I remember the Rome Olympics and him coming home with gold, and we, he was this promising guy. I remember all the braccadocios, so that by the time you get to the Liston fight in 64, there are lots of people saying, just shut him up. Liston's going to shut him up and put this guy, because he wasn't behaving the way an athlete should, meaning modest, well, you know, I'm open to do this. And he's also a black athlete, not behaving the way people think a black athlete to be. But but we loved him. He was so unbelievably charismatic. What's more important is that we've got all of that and lots of it. But there's spaces in between when this teenager or this early 20-something is speaking softly with wisdom and, and unbelievable poise. Like, it doesn't matter that he's a boxer. His daughter, Rashida, told us in the film at the end, you know, boxing was this much, pinching her fingers together. And, and you realize that's right, he could have taken something else. He knew he had a destiny, and every once in a while, when he loses to Frazier, when the Supreme Court vindicates him, or, or some other moment when he's talking about perhaps stopping boxing because the Nation of Islam isn't cool about the frivolousness of sports, he's saying, I know I'm here for a purpose. I know I'm supposed to do something. So while I'm wowed by what a genius, he's the best promoter ever, better than any promoter yeah. that ever tried to promote him, and in fact, when um, he, he testifies at the, in 63 in, in, up in Albany about, uh, you know, corruption in, 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 uh, in boxing, and he's going to go fight in New York City at Madison Square Garden, which hasn't sold out. He's promised to sell it out, and then all the newspapers go on strike. And so they're saying, look, 
you're dead in the water, buddy. Guess what? They sold it out for the first time in years because he went door to door. He went to the radio stations. He talked to the guys. He went to, to various places. He walked the streets. He said, come, hey, watch me fight, you know? And they did. He, he did that in Louisville. He went door to door. And he, he understood by watching Gorgeous George, this, this wrestler who was hated, he understood that, you know, it doesn't matter what the crowd thinks about you, right? He says, boo, hiss, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. Yeah. He got that. He got that part of it that it's just show. And if, if, if you're going to be the guy they boo, then you're going to be the guy they boo. He just happened to be the most spectacular athlete I, of the 20th century. I love it because it's it's such a fascinating part of the fight game in particular because it's, yes. it's very unique to fighting. But like... You know, you even see now with like a Conor McGregor who may be past his prime, but people are still buying because he's able to promote it. And it's very few and far between that you have a boxer or a fighter with both talent and exceptional promotion skills. And he was the whole package. And, and, and then also being something else. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Muhammad Ali is intersecting with all the major themes of the last half of the 20th century. The role of sports, the role of black athletes, race, faith, religion, politics, war. And now when we have dug into his personal life and his family life and his four wives and all of that, all the questions that are about us with the Me Too movement. So it's, he's as relevant today as at any time. And so, you know, I made another film back in 2005 on Jack Johnson, the first African-American heavyweight champion, who is a film called Unforgivable Blackness, because that's, you know, when they couldn't beat him in the ring, they just figured out a way to get him out of the boxing ring and trumped up charges against him. And, um, and W.E.B. Du Bois, a great scholar, said it all comes down to his unforgivable blackness. And, and you know, I'm not a boxing fan per se, but I really pay attention when it's a Jack Johnson or more who cared only about himself, or more importantly, a Muhammad Ali who doesn't only just care about himself, he cares about his people, and, he, and that extends to the world. So when this guy dies, he dies the most beloved person on the planet. Mm -hmm. And remember how divisive he is in the 60s, yep. how yep. what a lightning rod he is for controversy. I'm interested in that transformation. I think it's as fascinating, and the problem is, because we live in an information age, is that we're all drowning in information. So basically, we carry our Ali baggage from moment to moment. We forget him for a while, we remember him, but we just remember that. And what Sarah and Dave and I, I think, wanted to do is replace the superficial and the Conventional with a much more complex and dimensional uh, portrait of who this guy was, good, bad, and otherwise. And we hold his feet to the fire for his failings. We're not unafraid of it. But let me tell you, man, this guy is a... He's about love. I mean, it's a four-letter word the FCC lets us use, but, you know, um, nobody wants to talk about it. It's too embarrassing. And, you know, there's a great shot early on, I'm sure you guys have seen it, which is in the Fifth Street gym in Miami. He's training for Liston, and the Beatles have, have invaded. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of him, fake shot, you know, punching John, and it looks like Paul and George and Ringo are going to topple over like dominoes. But then I got to thinking, these, these five men understood what how the universe really runs and they'd spend the rest of their lives three of them are now gone Ali and Harrison and Lennon but two are alive and best embodied for all five of them including Ali by words that that um, McCartney wrote which is you know and in the end the love you take is equal to the love you make and by the end this divisive person is the most loved person on the planet. I want to know how you get from point A to point B and even how you get up to point A from the childhood and, and how we are now and how much he speaks. There's a wonderful shot at the end of the film of some protest. We deliberately don't really show you what that protest is on the Brooklyn Bridge. And there's a young black woman and she's wearing a simple black t-shirt with white letters. And all it says is Muhammad Ali. That's all she needed in this day and age to make a statement about courage, to make a statement about um, 
passion to make a statement about freedom. Because remember, we talk about athletes speaking their mind and some idiots say, shut up and dribble. That's ridiculous. We live in a free country. Anybody can say something. But he risked everything. Mm -hmm. He lost three and a half years at his prime for sticking up for his beliefs. And he could have gone into the army. They would have put on, they would have put him in combat. He'd do USO shows. He'd box and, and you know, mug with people. He knew that and he wasn't going to do it. He said, I'd rather face machine gun fire than to do that. So all of a sudden, when people begin to look back and say, maybe the Vietnam War wasn't a good thing, he had them. They, they, they were, this was the transformation that America needed. And, and this idea of courage is there. Now, we have other athletes who take a stand, and you could think that Carlos and Smith in the 68 Olympics risked something. Uh, Kurt Flood, a black man, tried to get the reserve clause, the plantation reserve clause, out of baseball. Mm -hmm. He had to go it would take two white guys, Messerschmitt and McNally, with Marvin Miller to make that happen. And Colin Kaepernick is paid dearly. But these guys that are speaking out today, they're, 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 they're great. I'm proud of them for speaking out. But they're not risking their Nike contract. They're not risking their football or their basketball contract or whatever. They're just doing what they believe. They have, though, as the avatar of their example, this man who was born Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. in Louisville, Kentucky, and who ended his life, Muhammad Ali, the most famous and the most loved person on the planet. Mm -hmm. I'd want to know. I'd want to know how that happened. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's interesting you brought up how you know we look back at Muhammad Ali as being you know an icon. We look at him as being a role model and all these things that you talked about. When at the time he was so divisive and the, the uh, like. Comparable person I think about when I hear an explanation like that, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the time when he was speaking, when he was traveling around the country, uh, he was hated. People didn't, was, people didn't like was, him. The FBI told him he should kill himself. I mean, like yes. this, this was a, a guy that um, you know stirred up a lot of emotions and a lot of them really, really bad from people who were resistant to change. But you look forward, you know, 50 years. And he's looked upon as one of the greatest Americans of all time. What exactly. Do you, what do you think happened? Um, not necessarily Dr. King, but with Muhammad Ali, because you've been researching him. What well, happened over the course of those years? Is it that we look back at Vietnam and we're like, maybe he was right about this after all? Or yeah, is there something else that kind of... I, I think there are a lot of things that contribute. I, I think Vietnam is one of them. You know, I think it's also when he came back, he wins his first two fights. Then he fights Joe Frazier in the fight of the century in 71, and he gets beaten. And in the last round, when he realizes he's losing on points and he has to go for a knockout, he gets knocked down, but he gets right back up. And afterwards, though he's been ragging on Frazier, he's calm and he, he's talking to the world. And he said, you know, we're all going to face losses and defeat. And, and we're all going to, you know, lose a job or lose a loved one or lose a title. And we have to show that we can take this. This is part of life. It's an amazingly poised comment. And Robert Lipsight, who's a young, who was then a young reporter who'd been following him for years, said, you know, in a way, Frazier won the fight, but Ali won America. And that's when kids who may have been repulsed by the stand on Vietnam now are beginning to understand. And when he comes back and wins the championship for the second time again, Against you know with, against George Fre Foreman in the Rumble of the Jungle in one of the greatest most artistically beautiful fights when everyone thought they were worried about whether he'd survive it whether he'd even live uh, to do it so I think there's all of that the hero's return and then I think he's they're beginning to realize that he was honest and he was direct and that was refreshing. He wasn't doing the nuke lanouche, you know, oh, I'm just trying to play within myself. And Crash Davis has to say, you idiot, that makes no sense, right? So so he was always honest and he was always direct. And, it, and that divisiveness is not necessarily on his account, it's our problem. So there's a moment when David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker and a great writer about Ali says, you know, maybe it proves that we can change. And I think the reason why we have a holiday for Dr. King and the reason why we can look back, I mean, people were sending a decapitated black dog's head to Ali before he fought Jerry Quarry in Atlanta to begin his comeback. Uh, you know, uh, you know, People don't like my film sometimes, but nobody does that. And he said, this is what we do to black dogs in Georgia, right? And, you know, this is in the 1970s. This is a big deal. And so I think 
that we've learned to understand that life isn't just, even in this binary world, it isn't just on and off, good and bad, black and white, gay or straight, male or female, rich or poor, north or south, east or west. It's much more complicated than that, and there's something really compelling and interesting about representing that complication. The persons closest to you guys are complicated. They're not perfect. And neither are you and neither am I. And, you know, you can either go with the perfect and therefore nobody's a hero, or you can understand that heroes have always been about n negotiating between their strength and their weaknesses. Remember, Achilles had his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strengths. Mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all like that. We're just smaller versions of these big, epic, mythic Greek heroes. So a question along that line, uh, we, we got the screener, we watched the, I watched the first one, um, I got the other three to go, so I'm sure you get into it, but I've always been fascinated about the end of Ali's boxing career. Yeah. And it's, boxing is, is one of those sports that for some reason guys hang on for a little bit too long, and it's always very sad. What was the motivation at the end? Because he is the greatest of all time, and then you have these memories of him, and you have these fights of him at the end, where he's a shell of himself. Yeah. What was the motivation behind sticking around and, and, and never being able to like fully give it up until it basically was well past the date? Well past. I mean, it's true in all sports. We see people, you know, we think of Babe Ruth as a Yankee, but he doesn't end his career as a Yankee. Think of Willie Mays as a giant. He doesn't end his career as a giant. And so there are people who are hanging on. With Muhammad Ali, it's such a fairy tale thing. He's won the championship three times, right? And so he keeps thinking that he can pull some rabbit out of the hat and it's way, way past his prime and everybody's begging him. His corner is abandoning him. His kids are saying, Daddy, don't fight anymore. And yet I think he's a generous person. He's given away most of his money. People who are managing him has, have mismanaged it. So there's the payday aspect of it. There's the wanting to be in the limelight. He loves other people. He loves the adulation. He loves to give back to it. He's always the last person signing autographs. Do you know what I mean? He had that mm -hmm. kind of just basic thing and it's really hard to turn it off be interesting say with tom brady to see whether you know if he has a bad year he's going to hang it up or whether he's going to say oh no 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 i can get better i pro i promise but it's nothing compares to ali it's excruciating as you watch those last couple of fights you just want to close your eyes and say please don't do this please don't do this and you're already seeing signs of the parkinson's that's going to encase him and 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 render him speechless and and that figure shaking at the uh, olympics in atlanta 25 years ago this summer you know surprising the entire world and it's really you know to answer your question too it's that moment that finally does it you know, where a lot of the hatred, I'm sure there's some people still out there with that unreconstructed view of him, but you know, when, when he came up there with the bravery of showing the world just the sheer depth of his affliction and everybody loving him back, you know, it's, it, it, that's, a, that's really when the full rehabilitation takes place. And then remember, he lives another two decades. Yeah, He's doing work, he can barely speak, so Michael J. Fox, who has at Parkinson's said, I couldn't be still until I couldn't be still, which is a beautiful, beautiful phrase of great enlightenment. And I think in some ways you could apply that to Ali, this voluble, loudmouth, wonderful, articulate, funny person. He really couldn't speak until he couldn't speak. And then he spoke volumes. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, he, you know, he'd hold a news conference when he was active and the sports world would stop. He went to Pakistan or Malaysia or Saudi Arabia, the whole country stopped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was beloved in Africa, in, in, in the Middle East, in Asia, all over the world. He was admired as someone who was speaking for everybody who's felt the boot of the man, you know? And, and that's, that took a lot of guts and courage because, you know, at some point in his life, he's being a little bit cautious when he's being treated badly because uh, he doesn't want to upset the Louisville sponsoring group, the white businessmen who are protecting his career. He wants to look good. And then somewhere along the line, he just sheds that and just becomes who he's supposed to be. It's a, it's a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, which if you float like one mm -hmm. and sting like a bee, like a you're one. Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, the rope-a-dope. I think yeah. we've all we've all heard the term. A lot of us have seen the fight. A lot of us have watched uh, various movies that have been made about Ali. 
Um, but when he executes the rope and dope against George Foreman, was there anybody uh, in his camp while it was leading up to the fight <laughs> that said, hey, uh, Muhammad, this is fucking crazy. You're just going to yeah. let George Foreman they, punch you he, in the stomach until he's tired, and then that's your plan to knock him out. They, he didn't even tell him what the plan was. They, they had been practicing. He had his own plan. And so it's not like beforehand this is fucking crazy. They get in the ring and they're screaming at him, get off the ropes, Angelo Dundee, get off the ropes. You know, uh, you know, uh, Boudini is get off the ropes. Everybody is doing that. And he knows what he's doing. He has calculated the odds. The great kind of classically tragic dimension to this is of course the an ability and the willingness to absorb those blows not just to body but to head are going to ultimately end his career and his life but until then that fight goes down as the Mona Lisa as you know a a masterpiece because he you know people were worried that he wasn't going to get out of that alive it's yeah. just it's just amazing and they're screaming at him to to do this and he knows what he's doing and it's right and if you watch that fight this is a guy that you know they just assumed would be the champion forever and ali old and out of shape and you know having lost to not only frazier but to you know to, you know to others he's he he just demolishes foreman it's just it's just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And it's because he's doing it a, a different way and he's had to adapt from the, you know, the, the float like a butterfly stuff that he, that he was already doing. It's, it's great. It's honestly insane yeah. to think that that's what his game plan was going to the yeah. fight. It's like, yeah. yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna let George Foreman punch me until he's tired and then I'll be able to knock it's him crazy. out. It's it, crazy. Yeah. He has so many iconic moments like that. that I, I want your Ken Burns uh, if if you had true serum or gun to your head, not actual gun to your head, but Sonny Liston won, did Sonny Liston use something to in Muhammad Ali's eyes? Yeah, I I, I think so. I, I think it was liniment. That's what uh, Ali said. That's what most everybody said. Somehow liniment got in his eye. Something happened. He was clearly winning on points every single round, which has startled the Liston camp and probably surprised the hell out of the uh, the Cassius Clay camp. He's Cassius Clay then. And then you know he's blind against one of the most ferocious boxers for a round and a half at least, if not two rounds. And then he comes back, and there's a kind of vengeance yeah and so you know uh it's 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 it, just an amazing it's incredible the the it's, the, the it, when you, you can't watch, make it up yeah when you watch ali uh basically be blind and hold his hand out knowing that if he's if he's touching sonny liston's head he can figure out where the punches are coming you from know, the, the force had to be with him right it's incredible he, had to, do, he yeah. had to do that blind and you can't make this up you tell this to a hollywood producer they go nah but this is what happened yes. and so one of the greatest fights of all time has to be that first liston fight just because the improbability of him being able to understand how to how to handle Liston and then be able to take the worst possible thing, this liniment in the eyes. And he's saying, cut the gloves off, I'm done. Get me out of here. I can't see because he knows exactly what you've just said. If if Liston lands one punch, his career is over. Right. right? I mean, he's just out and he's not gonna get a, another shot at it. And so, you know, the fact that he lives through that and then comes back and now, you know, if he was mad before. He's really mad, and Liston doesn't stand a chance at that point. All right, and so then my follow-up question was Liston, too. Is that Liston a phantom two. punch or no? Like, where do you I, land? Because you tell the story, but yeah, where do you, I, if you had to say? I don't have the chops. I, I got to believe Remnick sort of, David Remnick sort of suggests, you know, like, we'll never know. That's true. We will never know. Was it fixed? I can't believe that it would be fixed in that regard. It has to come down, and I don't think that punch was that good. So regardless of what he was saying, I think somewhere along the line that Liston, who had trained really hard before Ali got sick and then was sort of dissipated, just sort of said after a round, you know, oh my God, it's the same as Miami. Here they are in Lewiston, Maine. I've already put the check in the bank. You know, first time he gets me, I'm going down. Mm -hmm. And he's acting. It's as as Michael Ben said, it's bad acting. Right. It's bad acting. You know, as Michael Ben says in our film, it's bad acting. So you know, it's it's just going to be one of those mysteries. So I don't count that in a good fight. First Liston, yes, fabulous. I think first, second, third Frazier, 
unbelievable. The third Frazier is maybe the greatest fight of all time because it's not even a fight anymore. It's about two men as close to death as you can get. And then the masterpiece, a Cleveland Big Cat Williams and Ernie Terrell, what's my name, what's my name? And then, of course, the masterpiece of all masterpieces, the rumble in the jungle, the, the Kinshasa Zaire fight against George Foreman. Yeah, L- Liston 2 is is famous because it's the most iconic picture of all time, too. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. that's when you think yeah. of Ali, you think of that picture. Of so. towering yes. over him, going, get up, yeah. you know? You actually yeah. chose yeah. A, a very photogenic person to make this documentary about. There's so much great He's, footage I, out I'm there. pretty as a girl. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. as a girl, right? He understood. He had the guts to be able to say that when nobody would say that. And he and he was right. He is the most gorgeous specimen, athletic specimen and shape. And he understood that by 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 promoting that attractiveness, he was promoting what he was doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the most boring subject that you could make an entertaining documentary about? Vacuum cleaners. You could do it? <laughs> Well, I, I hope it wouldn't suck. That's, oh, that's awesome. Damn, we that walked into awesome. that one. You guys that walked into good. that. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, that shit. was good. Oh, man. I had one last question for you, Ken. Uh, so we talked about, the obviously, the, the rumble in the jungle. <laughs> um, I remember watching When We Were Kings. My, my dad actually took yeah. me to it in really the Really great film. Yeah, he's like, you got to watch this. It's important. Yeah. That was kind of like the first, you know, big, big sports documentary now it's everywhere yeah. what do you think about like I, there's a weird spot we're in right now where there's some documentaries where the subjects are part of it and and they get to tell their own stories how yep. like do you think that this is good for everyone or do you think there's a point where we're maybe doing too many documentaries no, we can't do too many documentaries, but I do worry, and PBS doesn't permit me, I can't have somebody who's the subject of the film being a co-producer of the film or the producer of the film. It just doesn't work. It's not based on what the congressional mandate or what you guys would expect. You, you just you just can't do that. So, you know, I'll, I'll make my films. At the end of the day, if the film is good, the film is good and people will watch it. And and that will be, that's, that's the ultimate uh, judge of it. And I, I think I'm thrilled that now sports is being taken seriously I mean when I was making my baseball film people were going you can't tell the story of America I said this is the sequel to my Civil War series they go you're out of your mind I said the first real progress in civil rights after the Civil War is Jackie Robinson coming up of course it's the sequel no but sports aren't as important sports are really important they're a a perfect mirror through which we can see us and I've spent the last nearly 50 years telling stories about the US but I've also told stories about us the two letter lowercase plural pronoun all of the intimacy of us and all of the majesty the complexity the contradiction and the controversy of the US and man I feel privileged like I have the best job in America yeah I love in your baseball documentary I would say is probably it's the best father-son piece of art yeah. maybe in America do you get that a lot people oh, being like, I get that all the time Listen, I can't, like I've, I've I can't open up to my dad but me and him sat I, down I, and watched, I've watched I've watched your I've watched your baseball film more than you, and I'm going. That's impossible. And he goes, Yeah, no. My dad and I watch it every January, and yeah. I go, Okay. So it's now been twenty, you know, whatever years. Uh, I guess you have, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. That that's one documentary that I can sit down with my dad and watch at any time, and it it does like it's a it's a family experience watching yeah. the story of baseball in America. Could yeah. we make Could we make a, a documentary about Ken Burns? Like, could I do that and then call it? a Ken Burns documentary and then hopefully PBS will <laughs> yeah, get confused right. and give me a bunch of money. <laughs> yeah. Listen, talk about vacuum cleaners. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, everyone should go check it out. September, uh, with September 19th, 19th. correct? Not September 19th. 19th, PBS, Muhammad PBS. Ali, as you've never seen it before, there's been a bunch of documentaries about him. This is going to be all of it. Soup um, to nuts. Yeah, yep. and and we really appreciate you coming on, Ken. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. All right, Take yeah. care. thanks so much. Be well. Great to meet you. Be well. Ken Burns is brought to you by NHTSA. For more information about Drive Sober or Get Pulled Over campaign, you can go to trafficsafetymarketing.gov. Check it out there. But it's Labor Day weekend. That means that the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is working together with law enforcement community to decrease impaired driving. I'm just going to tell it to you straight. I'm going to go off off script right now. There are going to be a lot of cops out this weekend. It's Labor Day weekend. You're going to be partying. You're going to be having fun with friends. You're going to be having fun with family at cookouts. You name it. You're going to be out at bars watching football. It's not the time to drive drunk. If you drive drunk, if you drive buzzed, you're going to get pulled over. 
best case scenario is that you get a DUI and you get a big strike on your record that's going to make your life a whole lot more complicated. Worst case scenario is you hurt or kill yourself or somebody else. During the 2019 Labor Day holiday period, 38% of fatalities in traffic crashes involved a drunk driver. There's no excuse to drive drunk with all the options that you have for different ways to get rides. You can get a designated driver. You can call a cab. You can use one of the apps on your phone that you have to get somebody to come pick you up and get you home safe. There's really no excuse to be driving drunk. Don't want to hear about any of our listeners getting into trouble. Don't want to hear about any of our listeners losing their lives, getting hurt. So please, please, please don't drive drunk. Drive sober or you get pulled over. That's the bottom line. And that's what we want to see out of you guys. No drinking and driving this weekend. No drinking and driving ever. But this weekend, I'm letting you guys know ahead of time, there's going to be a ton of cops out. Be safe. Get home safe. Get home in one piece. Okay, let's finish up. We got Fire Fest of the week. Reminder, Tuesday, no show Monday, Labor Day. Tuesday, new show with Andy Staples. Wednesday, new show with Brooks Kepka. And can I say the guest? Yep. Logic. Yeah. Yeah. It's already done. Awesome interview. We already taped it. Logic. And then we'll have Friday, we'll do a big uh, preview with Warren Sharp, getting us into week one of the NFL. Football is all the way back, baby. It feels great. But let's do Fire Fest of the week. And also tune in to us at Liberty National on Tuesday while we caddy Brooks Kepka. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Ish. Uh, my Fire Fest, uh, it's Barstool Sportsbook related, living in Jersey. Sportsbook's live there. Uh, my usual routine is like, you know, I'll wake up, check the sportsbook, see what I like, and then I forgot. You Sometimes I'll put picks in uh, at my apartment before I leave on this particular day, yesterday, Wednesday. Um, I waited, waited until I got to the train station. There was like a 10 minute wait for my train. I was like, all right, I'm going to put my picks in. Uh, there's a feature on the app where you can, I made three MLB picks and then there's a feature where you can parlay them, mm -hmm. which I like. And I'll just, you know, sprinkle a little bit on the parlay just to see. But because the train was so close to the border of New York city, it wasn't like registering my location. Yeah. So I couldn't put it in. Obviously the picks went three. No, oh. that's tough. That's that hard. is, and one of them was the Dodgers. It was the last game of the night. They like it was, it was close. I thought they were gonna lose. I would have been like, all right, one and two didn't lose the par or didn't win the parlay, whatever. But three and zero oh, with a potential parlay on top of it would have been nice. I'd rather go zero oh and three than have that happen. Right. That's why I was rooting for the. I was watching mm -hmm. the Braves Dodgers. I was like, I hope the Braves win, just so like I don't have to like have that hanging over my head. Of not only did I go three and zero, oh, but I also would have had the parlay hit. So really like four or five and zero oh, if you're looking at unit numbers. But whatever. That's but brutal. Really, gambling is just about like how you feel mentally. So in a way, you got to have some confidence going into the weekend. You're hot right now. I think that still qualifies you as being hot. I yes. Don't know. Yes. No, it does. No, it does. You're hot. No, you're but that's the bad, board. though. That's no, almost worse. When, yeah, you're yeah, hot, yeah, when you're hot, when you're hot, you know you're going to be not soon no, enough. No, but, but Big Cat's so right. You're, you're wasting your hotness on losers. Yeah. You're wasting your hotness without any benefit. You could just fade me publicly. Yeah, I will, obviously. Mm-hmm. And tweet about it. You're Zach Galifianakis right now, <laughs> sitting down at, really at the blackjack table. Yeah, it was it was hurtful. <laughs> but like, it was a troll move. I didn't expect you guys, guys were talking about. It. I was it trying hurt. to promote it the hurt. sports book. You guys are whole. That's thing. a troll move, not an inside the house move. Call was coming from inside. But the like, house. it's also like you were acting yeah, like it it's hurt. not. It, it, it hurt. hasn't been a reoccurring thing it that's hurt. happened for the better part of like ten years. Yeah, but you it were hurt. texting me as it if hurt. it was the first time it I've hurt. Ever you. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt to publicly do that. Have my guy do that. Especially after I was ready to. I was ready to put on my shoes and go fight someone's new boyfriend who didn't end up being a new boyfriend. Yeah. I was going to fight him. I appreciate right. that out of you. Got trolled. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. Hey, All you right. look good, though. You look I wasn't good. trolled. Oh, yeah. What about, your, what about your, uh, your trainer? New workout regimen. That's just fire. Yeah? Yeah. Why? No fest. Yeah. Why is it fire? Because I'm getting jacked. He's getting jacked. You are getting you jacked. You have a... Uh, What's what, this guy's name? Yeah, what is his name? Don't worry about it. What's his name? I'm not telling you. Who's your trainer? I don't want you to know. Is he big? Yeah, my trainers, you know, they're in shape. They're in there? So it's non binary. Is, that, is it a she? I don't like to give people pronouns, you know. Is it you, a never, chick? you never know whether or not people what what they she, want to go What by. does she look like, Hank? What who cares? Is it you have you have a female trainer? PFT, any questions? Uh I never said Is that. there is there a boxing <laughs> training class that you can sign up for and, and like the trainer puts on a nightgown and then runs you over with a zero radius mower? <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Okay, if there is, let it's me know. It's actually Soul Cycle. Soul Cycle. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Like it. You got it. Uh, Do you like her? Like, my trainer's like, nice. Yeah, my like, trainer's nice. Like more than a trainer. <laughs> <laughs> You're a no. training bra right now. Does she listen to the show? I don't know. 
Okay. Probably not. Well, if she does, sup for yeah. Hank. Sup for Hank. Sup. See a trade. Hank really likes, you know, the body blows. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know what we're talking about Me neither. Anymore. I'm never telling you guys anything. No headshots. <laughs> All right, BFT, your fire fest. <laughs> I just, it's very funny to just imagine Hank getting beat up by a, a boxing trainer. Mm -hmm. I don't, Regardless I of know, the gender. I know what you think is funny to imagine me doing. <laughs> What? Oh yeah. What? I just I I don't even want you to. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Hank. Okay. I uh, listen. Bros are rooting for bros right now. I'm pulling for you. We're pumping each other up. There you go. 2021, physically, mentally, spiritually. Hell yeah. Is that mm -hmm. it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, my fire fest is I well, I sat down with KFC yesterday and recorded a behind the mm -hmm. blog episode. Uh, where we got really deep into like my past, my present, like a lot of stuff about me that I don't really share on this podcast a lot because we like to have fun, talk about sports. Oh, you guys got keep deep. it moving, etc. We got pretty deep, and he, oh, nice, he's Hank. real deep, real deep, Hank. And so he started asking me about you know the sunglasses and things like that, and I told him uh, something I've been thinking about for a while here, which is the sunglasses at at some point can be a big hindrance to me, and not only like. Just being around the office when people are filming things, I have to worry about, you know, if I'm in the background, toss the glasses on real quick. If somebody catches me and then they put it out on Twitter, the person who videoed me just doing their job gets a lot of shit because I happen to be in the background. That's mm -hmm. not fair to them because that's not their decision. It's my decision. So it starts to impact other people at times. And then if we're doing an interview with somebody who might not know us and they don't have a lot of time to get to know us or haven't heard what we're about, they sit down and they're like, what's the deal with the guy with the glasses? And you can see usually at the start of the interview before they get into the rhythm with us, they're just like, it, it throws it off a little bit. And that's something that like I, I've been noticing and, and thinking about for a while. And also when we do live streams, the one thing people don't really know is that when we're doing a live stream, when we're watching TV, I can't see the television mm -hmm. because of the polarized glasses. So I have to like put my head to the side and it sucks. It makes NFL Sundays way worse. If I'm doing a live stream, I have to like look out of the corner of my eyes the entire time and strain them. So I'm trying to think of ways to partially lose the glasses mm -hmm. and i'm also thinking that people are going to be pissed when they see my eyes at least for a little bit yeah not because they're like freak eyes i think i'm a pretty normal looking guy but um it's no, just something freak that hasn't I, been no, out there for a while big time freak eyes. huge freak <laughs> so i'm trying to think of ways to to ditch the glasses at times not fully yeah and in certain points picking and choosing for those reasons that i put out there it's not something that like oh and also if i have to wear them like in a bar at nighttime mm -hmm. if we're doing like an event I just walk into tables. Yeah. I'm a, I might as well be a blind that person. That kind of is funny, though. Walking around. I think that you should do, you should put it to the AWLs to, to try to, uh, we should we should get them to maybe subscribe to a certain YouTube. Yeah. And Speaking of that, uh, the Grit Week video is coming out today. There we, go. there we go. So that's a good start. Gas it up. So how many how many subscribers do we have right now? 270. 270. 270. 270. We need 300, if right? We, if, we get, if we get to 300. Let's get to 300. We'll push it to 300. I'll Everyone do it. Everyone go subscribe, and we'll do it on the YouTube. We'll do it on the YouTube. We'll do it on the YouTube. We got to figure out a cool way to do it. Yep. Um, but, yeah, it's just it's something I've been thinking about for a while. And, obviously, like, I would still keep the glasses for most of the time that we'd be doing the show. I know you'd probably be weirded out just, like, because we've been doing the show. Yeah, it would be a little weird, but that's fine. You do whatever you want. I, I support you in all your endeavors. What about so. you, Hank? Hank's got a little smirk. Mm -hmm. What's the smirk? No, I, I support it. I've, I've, I, I think it's... Impressive how long you've gone keeping them on as often yeah. as you do. Yeah. All right. So that's just what I've been getting off my chest. Also, if you think it's a shitty idea, let me know. There will definitely be some people to be mad, but guess what? In like two days, they'll won't even remember that you had glasses. Yeah, I can't see people holding on. Is there, to a, is there a, a wrestler equivalent to this? Like taking off Kane, yeah, Kane, Kane taking off the mask, and too. now now he's and a mayor. Was, now he's a mayor. Yeah. What happened with that? I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to. Yeah, like, sort of weird. I was weirded out, but then get over it. Did Rey Mysterio ever take his off? Uh, I don't, I don't know. No, he did in an interview, but not on WWE. So there it is. You're right. I don't think. Or uh, what's his name from uh, the Kiss? Those guys when they took their makeup. Oh off, yeah, that's very weird. That's really strange. Yeah, it was very. When they very do that. Weird. I, I think you're right. I think that there will be people that will be upset for like a couple days, but I can't see somebody like months from now being like, I wish you no. would put his sunglasses no one's, back Yeah, on. right. So 300,000, let's get it. Let's get the people motivated. 300,000, we'll do the reveal on a YouTube. We'll figure out a way to make it fun. Let's fucking do it. 
And they're freak eyes. They are freak eyes. Yeah. So you want to see them. Real nasty. They're fucking gross. You've never I'm seen, puke. You've never seen <laughs> eyes like these before. <laughs> they're actually gray. He's got no soul. It's like Cal Ripken Jr. <laughs> you see right through Actually, them. he's like Max Scherzer. Yeah. I should wear, I should get some sick you should. contacts. You should. Maybe red contacts. Or yeah. uh, uh, what was it? Uh, witches. Yes. Where they had purple eyes. That Ooh. fucked me up for a really long time. What about the people? Have you ever seen the cat eye contacts? You can get contacts that make it look like you have cat eyes. Yeah. Or goat eyes. Yes. Which are, those are the devil ones. Yes, yes. Um, all right. Uh, let's, let's, oh, my fire fest. Yeah. Uh, I broke my computer, and I'm about to have a seizure looking at it. So that's about it. How'd you break it? I closed it Pornography. with a pen inside of it, and now the screen is completely smashed, and it looks like I'm going to have a seizure. How hard you close it? That was it. And it did it. Computers are fucking soft. They're soft ass, ass bitches. You should try to get like one of the you know the super durable ones that they give to people that have to like go out in the field on oil rigs. Mm -hmm. Ones that have like the the uh, plastic and rubber around the side. What yes. are those called? Tough books. Yeah. Tough oh books. yeah, yeah, yeah. You should get a tough book. And you get the it's that and uh, the Nokia that basically is a walkie-talkie, not a phone. Or it's Nextel. Yeah. yeah. Nextel. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's I, that's I, the starter set for being a badass. I've actually that actually those are cool. Really cool. Be, have, being a like on phone, a construction site yeah. is cool. A cell phone hose what was that guy called is pretty in those cool commercials. Too. Uh, fuck, I don't remember. You know, what I'm, you know the commercial I'm talking about. They were the coolest commercials for the cell phones. Yeah, the chirp. -chir. It was it was like oh a, yeah, the chirp ones. Was it just chirping? Fuck, I'm gonna find this new cell phone from Nokia. Oh yeah, this one's not for pussies. They were yellow. Yeah. Two way. Two way. Yeah. All right, uh, Jake. Uh, I have two fire yeah. fests. I hinted at both of them earlier this week, but they're still bothering me to this day. Uh, one is I still have a stiff neck. Yeah. My neck is still diagonal. Oh, yeah, pussy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Let's just get right to it. And uh, just my shoulders are still not whistling even. Whistling through the weed you patch. You are a. Yeah. People people think Jake is a nice guy, and he is. He's a savage with the box. Mm -hmm. Straight up. Yep. Straight up. Uh, <laughs> Put that on a quote card. I mean, you, people always wonder, Jake, how, how is your mouth so good at pronouncing all these difficult names? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of training. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And number all two. All Jake does all day at his desk is is tie cherry stems <laughs> <laughs> and, and try yeah. to impress people. He's got like a stack of Starburst wrappers <laughs> next to him. Yeah, so hopefully it loosens up over the weekend. I've tried pretty much Jake everything. loves to eat pussy. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and second off, we are one week from NFL kickoff, and Scorgami is still down. Ah! So I'm really officially getting worried. What? This is bad. Wait, Jake, can't you just go back and look at old Scorgami charts, and then you can just. I mean, the website is like the master list. Okay. Like, you don't have the website. Oh, Nothing else is. It's like the yellow line. Yellow line is unofficial. It's Scorgami. Yeah. Scorgami is the chains. Everything else is the yellow so line. So what? What do we do if it's not up? I don't know. I saw a uh, uh, different. How about kill ourselves? I don't I know. Saw a different. Like, that's crazy. What's media... the point of watching football <laughs> if you don't know if that score's ever happened yeah. before? <laughs> I saw a different media companies doing a feature on the Scorigami guy this weekend, so hopefully there's some answers unveiled there. We'll see. There, that's probably what it is. If they're, they're unveiling like yeah, a new. They're revamping it. Interface, got, like a new user. Yeah, new UI that's all set up. Next gen Scorigami. Yeah. So we'll see, Love but I'm, I'm nervous. I like the old school feel of the Scorigami website, though. Mm -hmm. It's like when you go on to the ELO chess rankings and all that, and it looks like it's straight out of 2009. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's I like, like the Super Bowl that. squares on steroids. Yeah, you don't, need to, you don't need to update something that's already perfect. Yes. Yeah, so I'm nervous, but we'll see. Billy, give us your fire fest and also uh, anything that we missed. Um, yeah, so I bought, I have some waterproof boots, a lot of flooding this uh, Any, last uh, night. Went Camouflage to, on them? They're just um, desert colored. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to, you know, wade through all Wait, the flooding. Billy, why would you ever buy, like, waterproof boots that are designed to blend into a desert environment? I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> I stepped into the water. One of the boots had some sort of hole in it. Mm -hmm. So I have one dry foot, one super Wait, is, soaked Wait, are foot. we looking at it right now? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is your right foot just soaked right now? Yep. It's the next day. Well, no, this morning. Oh. There's still water. Got I it. have to go back through. 
a lot of water <laughs> to get home. Very clear which one is not waterproof. Yep. Well, <laughs> uh, got one soggy sock. You wouldn't make yeah. a good. Well, no, you got in here, so you would make a good troop. Have I you, got through. Yeah. Have you uh, have you considered like wrapping up your legs with something as you're walking through? Oh the no, because I, I see all the brown water, and I'm like, if if somebody has a scrape on their leg, there's some parasites in there. Yeah. So definitely gonna go with some plastic bags next time. Okay. Good. Um, always, right. always wrap it up, Billy. Um, does Mike Vrabel actually hate Tom Brady? Did I don't you guys think see so. that? I saw yes. the video. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely, it's no yeah, doubt. real animosity between mm -hmm. Tom Brady and Mike Vrabel, and not yeah. at all just because like they're former teammates that shared a locker room for years and years and years and won Super Bowls together. Also, speaking of Tim Tebow earlier, Jake Paul wants Tebow to box. Oh, another thing Paul that Tim Tebow can fail at. Yeah. Eh. You yeah, think he'd be a good boxer? Exactly. That's what everyone said with the tight end. Uh, Imagine how Mets. long it would take uh, for him to throw a punch. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, he could do. Okay. I think he would. He would look so side. stiff, and he would get knocked out, and everyone would be like, "Well, he tried." Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then he would rise again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything point, else? Uh, no. Okay. I Great. think I think Coley said that Tim Tebow is like the ultimate Joe in pros versus Joes. He should just have like. A, a, a reality show that has him competing and getting defeated yes. by every single former professional athlete yes. in every sport. I love it. I love it. 84. 99. 8. 18. I should credit my source. It's, it's Mina Kimes doing the Scorigami feature. Excited. Okay. Shout She's, out to what Mina. What is she doing? Oh, the feature. feature. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Justin Herbert also uh, is a cart return guy. 69. 11. Eleven. First timer. Whoa! We score still have, we still have like 15 left. 15? We have 6, 14, 15, 20, 22, 26, 27, 29, 44, 49, 51, 63, 76, 78, 81, 88, 97. That was very fast. Your tongue was really working on that Give, one. I'm going to start taking 97. I'm going to will 97. All right. Sharks can't clap. I love you guys. 99% of animals can't clap. It's funny, though, with sharks. <laughs> I mean, come on. Think about it. Could a T-Rex... Do a push up. <laughs> <laughs>